This is uh, the second day of our celebratory conference and symposium in honor of our colleague, mentor, friend, uh, Roberta Carmel, Professor Roberta Carmel. Uh, today's conference it will focus on three panels. We have three panels for you. Uh, we're gonna get momentarily underway with our first panel, which is on corporate governance. Then our second panel will be at 11.15, that's on securities market structure. Uh, after a quick break for lunch, we'll then come back and have our two o'clock panel on financial services and financial intermediaries. And then at 3.30, we'll have a wrap up. We're delighted that you are joining us. We will get underway with my colleague. I'm gonna pass it now to my colleague, Professor Dana brackman Reeser, who will introduce her panel Take it away, Dana. Thanks, Miriam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, we have a terrific panel uh, this morning on corporate governance, one of uh, the topics that I've learned about the most from uh, Roberta Carmel. And we have uh, three speakers who will be talking about their papers inspired by her work, uh, Professor Jack Coffey, who as an Adolph Burley Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. We have Jill Fish, who's the Saul A. Fox Distinguished Professor of Business Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And we have Joan Hemingway, who is the Rick Rose Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Tennessee College of Law. And following their presentations, we will have comments from Professor Minor Myers, who is at the University of Connecticut School of Law, but a former colleague of Roberta's and mine here at Brooklyn. Uh, so each of our speakers will address us for about 15 minutes in turn on their slice of this topic, corporate governance. Uh, and after Miner's comments, and I'm sure some insights from Roberta, we will turn to the audience for questions. So take it away, Professor Coffey. Okay. I'm now hopeful we can put up my PowerPoint slides if my assistant is doing this. Brian, can you put them up? Put up the- uh, uh, Yes, sir. Uh, do we see them? Uh, they can see them. Maybe we get me on the screen too, but I'm not important. Uh, before I get to the cartoon, let me just say a word about Roberta. This is a, a high powered panel with lots of people who could be doing other things today, but we all agree that the most important thing we can do is to celebrate Roberta Carmel's fantastic career. She has been a pioneer and a trailblazer for more decades than she wants us to recall, but she's had a number of firsts. Not only was she the first SEC commissioner who happened to belong to the female persuasion, but look how wide the door has been open. For the last five years or so, a majority of the commissioners have been female. This is uh, the kind of thing that requires that first person to open the door and prove how good they can do. Uh, and that certainly has happened. All right. Uh, I would draw one little sort of self-interested analogy from a Columbia perspective. Roberta's career in some ways parallels that of a Columbia professor by the name of uh, RBG. Uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, also was the same generation, the same era, and I think the two of them really do share credit for having been there at the outset at the creation, opening the doors for the first women in their fields. So I think of those two as something of a linked pair. Okay, now let me get back to my topic. You have a cartoon here, which is sort of a, a post-apocalyptic cartoon. This is a tattered, battle-scarred investment banker trying to explain to the next generation how he and his colleagues ruined the earth and turned it into an oven. Now, I don't think that's probably going to happen, but I'm not more sure than 99%. There is that remaining 1% possibility. Okay. Uh, and the view that uh, maximizing shareholder value will at all times produce the best results for mankind. Uh, this cartoon is meant to imply that doesn't necessarily happen. Now, I'm going to be focusing on a particular kind of investor. I'm focusing on them because until recently, they were probably the least interested in corporate governance, the most unwilling to engage in activism, the most deferential to management, and uh, in terms of social awareness, they were simply inert. 
But all that has changed. They are no longer passive. These are the giant index funds. The big three of these, are, of course, are BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. And together, they control an extraordinary percentage of stock. They own about 20%, and they own about they vote about 25% of the S&P 500, which is the giant companies that can have impact on our environment for better or for worse. Now, why were they passive for so long? Well, here the answer is simple. They own a tremendous number of stocks. State Street indicated uh, last month that they were holding for the long term, meaning they were never going to sell them, uh, the stocks of some 10,000 separate issuers. Once you own 10,000 separate issuers, you can't get caught up in the weeds. You can't get involved in the practical details of running any of those 10,000 companies. And that's what principally created passivity, okay? But there's a second factor too, uh, because uh, they invest in the same indexes. They promise their clients that they're gonna invest in certain indexes such as the S&P 500. All right. Uh, if you do that, there's no longer going to be competition among you in terms of uh, investment returns or investment selection. What's left? Well, you can compete in terms of cost minimization. Who can spend the less to leave the most assets to your investor clients? Well, that focus on cost minimization also correlated with never getting involved in activist campaigns because activist campaigns are expensive. Okay, what has happened? Why has there been a reversal? Go to the next slide, Brian, to one to three. Okay, why has there been this reversal? Now here I wanna get a little bit above simple rules and statutes and talk about basic economics. Two key forces are driving this transition. It's a transition which has seen institutional investors belonging to this sort of index group become our most activist investors in terms of pushing managements towards new rules on climate change and new rules on diversifying boards of directors based on race and gender. What's driving them? Why are they doing this? Well, two key forces are behind this. First, there is something I'm going to term systematic risk being highly diversified and holding an enormous number of stocks, uh, they are interested as a matter of simple economic principles uh, in those risks that cannot be diversified away. They don't have a position on whether or not company X should sell off a laggard division because there's too many stocks to worry about. Instead, they're interested in those risks that are gonna affect all stocks. These stocks, these risks are called systematic risks because they are the risks that cannot be mitigated through diversification. And there is no better example of such a risk than the uncertainties associated with climate change. Thus, they are focused uniquely, unlike other institutions, on systematic risk. Then there's the second factor, high common ownership. Because these universal investors is, promise their clients that they'll invest in the same indexes, the S&P 500 and others, they cannot compete in terms of investment selection, uh, and thus they have extraordinarily high common ownership. The big three, as I said earlier, hold 20%, vote about 25% of the stock in S&P 500 companies, and this is predicted fairly realistically to be rising up to about 30% in just a few more years. So no one today has been more activist on the subject of climate change than the big three. Uh, now, how far can that go? Let's go to our next slide, Brian. Okay, here are the important implications. First of all, as is obvious, high common ownership means that the big three, who certainly know each other and communicate, hold a de facto control block. 25% uh, of voting and only got to go to a few more, and you're going to be up to about 40% of other major institutional investors who are interested in systematic risk. Uh, so you have a control block. But much more important is a point that's harder to understand. Uh, these investors are able to make decisions on any kind of voting decision, not simply on what the impact will be on that one stock, the stock that, at whose annual meeting they're voting, but in terms of what the impact will be on their entire portfolio. And their entire portfolio is essentially the market. 
Thus, if a decision might hurt a portfolio company, it still can be justified if you're going to get greater gains on the rest of the stocks in your portfolio than you are going to lose on the stock as respect to which you are voting. And that leads to the next and really quite revolutionary point, uh, taking collective action to curb undesirable corporate behavior, curbing so-called negative externalities, makes perfectly logical economic sense so long as the investor will have gains to its portfolio that exceeds the losses to the company that was imposing that externality. Now, that's true only for those investors that have market-spanning portfolios, as, of course, the big index investors do. Hedge funds and smaller institutions can't act in this fashion because they do not hold a portfolio that mimics the market. That hedge fund may own 6 or 7% of the stock it wants to influence, but it only owns five or six other stocks in its portfolio at that time, and they don't diversify, and they won't capture the gains if we curb the negative externality. Let's put this in a simple kind of case. Let's suppose that Exxon, as our largest oil company, will profit $10 billion from continuing to impose pollution, from not putting in place uh, various reforms that will reduce its carbon footprint. But other companies in the market portfolio owned by the big three investor will actually lose 20 billion if Exxon continues to impose pollution on the economy. So what do you do? If you see a 10 million loss to Exxon from imposing reforms, but a 20 million gain to the rest of your investors, you have a strong economic incentive to halt such misbehavior. This is a totally new source of enforcement. It's not the small investor suing for securities fraud. It is the voting investor who wants to curb negative externalities if and when, and only to the extent that it, from a portfolio-wide perspective, can see, can see greater gains to its portfolio than it sees losses to the one company that has been imposing that externality. Let's go to the next slide, Brian. These, this is an example of the worst possible kind of PowerPoint slides. Many, too many words, but you can sort of follow what we're doing. Okay, now all of this derives from a focus on systematic risk, uh, which is exactly what these big institutions are most focused on, and having a large portfolio that spans the market. But this means that the traditional activists, today activism, has been dominated by activist hedge funds. And they have a standard methodology. They typically will buy a five or 6% position, which necessitates, and they want this, that they make certain disclosures to the market by filing a Schedule 13D with the SEC. And when they file that schedule, they'll propose a program for reform. Let's sell off these laggard divisions Let's leverage ourselves up to our eyeballs so we can buy back more stock. And let's increase stock dividends, stock buybacks, and get rid of that dumb management. Typical response to such a program without more, just because you're disclosing what you'd like to do, is an average return of 6% on that day, a market-adjusted return of 6%, which is a very quick profit. It makes hedge fund activism quite a profitable business. However, when our goal is to reduce systematic risk and the profit lies not in a gain to the target stock, but to in a loss to the target stock that we offset by greater gains to the rest of the market, hedge funds are pretty much crippled. The last thing that you can do is invest in five or 6% of a stock that you expect to go down because of the activities that you are supporting, okay? Thus, the typical leader of an activist campaign the activist hedge fund is gonna be absent without leave because it would be unwise for it. We could divert here and talk about, well, maybe the hedge fund could sell short or have a short influence campaign. There are reasons why that won't work and why that would be contrary to several SEC rules, but the big point is that would take much too long of a detour into securities law. I wanna focus on the big economic concept, curbing negative externalities is something only these universal investors are well positioned to do. But they do need an ally to work with them because while we have seen 
these large investors engage in voting against management, we haven't seen them take the lead. They are shy about taking the lead, largely because they're still committed to a strategy of cost minimization. Okay, how can we get them to work with allies who will do the leadership role subsidized and supported by these investors? Brian, go to our next slide if we can. Okay, I'm gonna skip what the hedge fund can do, but let's just look at a world in which we have these three investors owning 20% voting 25%. Uh, what they need to do, and what has happened in Britain for 30 or 40 years now, is that institutional investors agree upon a cost sharing strategy. Those who have the largest box will share the cost of leading a proxy campaign. Now, I think that is feasible, not easily to, to be implemented tomorrow. I think it is feasible that the big three and maybe two or three others could engage in a cost sharing protocol under which they would pay the costs. Some of these costs might be paid to firms like ISS, which are happy to be hired to do the research and to draft proposals. And there might be another possibility. My most idealistic hope, and you'll say this is unrealistic, but maybe the most idealistic hope would be to form alliance with public interest environmental firms. For example, the National Resources Defense Council or the Environmental Defense Fund. They would draft a shared proposal based on their acknowledged expertise and independence. Uh, they would initiate the proxy contest, but the costs would be subsidized by the big three or other similar large diversified investors. That would give credibility to the effort because the integrity of the uh, NRDC or the EDF are respected, and it would spare the universal investors from having to lead the campaign, which involves them in bearing unreimbursed costs. They're willing to bear equal costs, so no one gains an advantage over them, but they would want they and their other colleagues to be sharing those costs. And also, this is a technical point I'll make in just a sentence, if we can give uh, a role to the public uh, environmental advocacy firm, of which there are a number that are very respected, it will spare the biggest institutional investor of any concern about securities law liabilities. Let's go to our next slide, Brian. As those of you who've taken securities law probably know, the Janus Capital decision says that uh, an actor is not liable for statements made by others where it did not control the statements made. Thus, even though it might be subsidizing them, it doesn't control the National Resources Defense Council or some other activist firm. Uh, and it would be possible to sponsor the activists, which would still have an independent board and real independence and avoid securities law liabilities. Now that's one possibility. Let's go back to my bottom line, because I think this is an important idea. Universal investors with their locked in focus on systematic risk, and sharing high common ownership by necessity can be a very important force for social good. In effect, the Sir Galahad of a new era of American corporate governance. Why? Because it is in their cold-blooded, rational economic self-interest to do good and do well at the same time at least so long as they have a market spanning portfolio, and at least so long as curbing the externality will produce gains that exceed the costs. How often that is, I don't know, but it does seem to be possible. Now, is this too utopian of you to be credible? Well, always there are gonna be problems. The devil is always in the details, but it is not inevitable. And there have been instances where the big three have gotten together to pressure major oil companies to change practices that were very costly and had long been fought by those oil companies. The question is whether we can get them to take the next step. Right now, they're willing to vote against management, but they haven't yet come forward to propose the proxy proposal or to subsidize those who will propose the proxy proposal. That is the future. If we go back to my next cartoon, many of my, my original cartoon, Many of you are sort of in the generation between the young investment banker uh, and the uh, youngsters around the campfire in the burnt out earth. Uh, you're going to see the possibility of major change depend on whether we can get these universal investors to take a larger role. They are speaking it, 
They are definitely talking the talk. They haven't yet begun to walk the walk, and that's something that's going to be happening over the next decade. And at this point, I think I'll stop and move it on to others to give you even more interesting views. Okay, back to you, Dana. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Coffey. Um, and our next speaker will be Professor Jill Fish. Um, so it's uh, an honor and a privilege to be here today and to be honoring Roberta with this conference. Roberta was really one of my early mentors and role models when I started teaching. And for those of you who are sort of coming up in the ranks, either as uh, practitioners or academics today, I don't think you can fully appreciate what it was like. Um, I mean, I started teaching over 30 years ago and there were no senior women anywhere. There were certainly no senior women, you know, teaching business law. Um, uh, there, were no, there was no one with Roberta's uh, sort of depth of experience and knowledge and connections. And um, I was so lucky because Roberta invited me to so many conferences and programs at Brooklyn. We had lunch, we had dinner. Um, she was always sort of provoking, you know, why do you think this? Can you support this? Have you looked at, at this issue or this question? Um, and people said yesterday um, that one of the things that may, makes Roberta's scholarship so timely today and so influential is the fact that she was always about solving problems. But I think it's also the case that she never kind of went along with the herd. She was always questioning, you know, this is the trend. Does this really make sense? And I think for the um, papers that are kind of the focus of this panel, you really do see that. So Roberta wrote as uh, shareholder voting, as institutional investors, some of the themes that Jack was talking about were just rising in importance. And Roberta had some questions. She was a little bit skeptical about whether, for example, shareholder voting really made sense and whether shareholders should vote on the range of issues that they vote on today. And she was also a little skeptical of institutional investors and their ability to exercise judgment and on whose judgment that uh, uh, was going to be, on whose behalf that judgment was going to be exercised. So when I reread uh, these articles in, in preparation for this talk in this paper, and this paper is very much a, a work in progress, um, what I was struck by is how relevant those concerns were to exactly the issues that Jack's paper and Jack's presentation were talking about. And I guess I had some of that same question or some of that same skepticism that I would bring to this current debate. Right. So what happened since Roberta wrote those three papers? Right. Uh, Jack's talked about institutional investor engagement. Institutional investors have gotten involved in corporate governance in a big way. Uh, they are voting, they are releasing public statements and they are talking behind the scenes with their portfolio companies. Um, that engagement is giving them increasing influence. Uh, companies are doing what institutional investors tell them to do. There are lots of studies talking about changes in policy, changes in who's on the board, changes in uh, environmental responsibility, changes in the structure of executive compensation, all due to that institutional investor influence, right? Um, so State Street has this uh, campaign to promote uh, 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 gender diversity on corporate boards. And State Street says that, you know, since their campaign started, 681 more women have been appointed to corporate boards. So that's an example of institutional investor influence. Um, and uh, of course, if we go outside the United States, this isn't just a voluntary choice, it's an obligation, right? More and more countries are saying, look, these big influential investors have to exercise their power for the good. Uh, we can talk a little bit about who's good, whether this is the good of shareholders or stakeholders or society more generally, some really tough questions, but they are imposing affirmative stewardship obligations, right? And so the UK Stewardship Code is, of course, an example of that, right? So what are the consequences? Um, so let's think this through. One, we have to think about the consequences of this influence on the firm, on firm performance, 
and on the economic interests of other shareholders. So the big three um, are, you know, hold an increasing share of large publicly traded companies. They don't hold the majority. Even if they did, there would be other shareholders. One of the things that Roberta always worried about is if institutional investors are involved, what happens to the interests of other shareholders? Right? A second question, and this is kind of flagged by Jack's cartoon, is societal impact. For a long time, shareholders were criticized because they promoted shareholder interests at the potential expense of society, right? That's just the destroying the world cartoon. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this binary shareholders versus society. And even if big institutional investors are thinking about societal interests, they're making normative choices. We have to think hard about the impact of those choices. Final consideration, potential agency costs. So I want to talk about all of these in a little more detail. That's, that's the focus of this paper, right? Um, just to be clear, right, we talk about institutional investors and the rise of shareholder democracy. It isn't just that the big three have more power, have more greater ownership stakes. They're also involved in a much broader range, shareholders, are involved in a broader range of issues than ever before in history, right? It's not just director elections and mergers. We now have say on pay, which has proven to be tremendously influential. Shareholders are now asking for more say on climate, say on political spending. Uh, there's a raft of shareholder proposals this year asking companies to convert to public benefit corporations, right? All of this stuff. Um, all of these types of shareholder voting were essentially unprecedented, even as few as 10 years ago, right? There also, we also see a shift from traditional corporate governance to stakeholder and societal topics. So if we're talking about shareholder voting on, say, uh, independent boards or uh, staggered boards or proxy access, right? Those tend to be shareholder votes that are driven largely by the perceived economic consequences of the vote of the corporate governance structure. But now we see a growing emphasis on ESG, on the interests of non-shareholder constituencies. And most recently, uh, corporate engagement in politics, whether corporations should be engaged, whether corporations should disclose their engagement, and whether corporations are compelled to take a stand on political questions. And this seems to me to create a potential witch's brew, that's what that picture is, uh, with respect to sort of the subject of shareholder democracy, right? So what are the challenges? Right? One challenge, can corporations do well by doing good? Now, Jack's paper kind of finesses this question. He says it's okay, right? You know, we can uh, cause Exxon to, make, to suffer a big loss if that's going to help the rest of Vanguard's portfolio. But in the ESG literature, most defenders of ESG make the claim, if you do well for society, if you do well for stakeholders, you will also do well for shareholders. In fact, these shareholder proposals promoting conversion to a public benefit corporation say shareholders should vote in favor of this because this is going to help shareholders. That empirical claim is at this point unproven, right? And it's a hard claim. It's, 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 it's a difficult claim. You know, do the methodology to really determine whether this makes sense. I think the, the jury's still out on that. But that's one of the challenges because let's keep in mind Vanguard, BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street, these are fiduciaries, right? At the end of the day, their engagement has to redound to the benefit of their shareholders. Now, whether it's an individual company by company effect or a portfolio effect, right? There has to be some sort of defense in economic terms. And I'll talk about why that's really important. Second problem, putting aside the economic value. We talk about corporations being responsible citizens. We are in a deeply polarized country today. There are multiple visions of the good, right? And we have to think hard about the claim when we say, all right, I want institutional investors to do the right thing. What is the right thing? And what does an institutional investor do 
if people disagree about the right thing. And the farther you get into that road of societal good as opposed to economic good, the more those questions involve judgment. And the more we're faced with the question, well, okay, who gets to decide? Is it the shareholders? Is it the portfolio managers? Is it the government? Is it the SEC? Is it someone else, right? So Jack's been talking about the big three and these are the shareholders, right? So these are shareholders involved in these kinds of questions, right? And this, you know, we typically think, you know, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, sometimes I'll have a little bubble that pops up with Fidelity, hi, we're here too, right? Um, you know, but these are the big influential investors, but not so fast. Remember these technically, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street, they are the record holders, right? But it's their beneficiaries that really have the skin in the game. It's the mom and pop who have their money invested in a 401k plan. Those are the true shareholders. Those are whose interests, BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, Fidelities, portfolio managers are supposed to be advancing when they engage, when they exercise their proxy voting rights and so forth, right? Um, that's not the person who makes Black Rock's voting decisions. That's not who decides recently that Black Rock should vote 91% of its proxies in favor of environmental proposals, right? Now, I don't know how many of you spend time reading shareholder proposals. There's a lot of environmental proposals out there. They've gotten a lot better. Um, proxy proponents have gotten more sophisticated. But the idea that 91% of those proposals should be supported seems to me to be a little bit of a stretch. And I'd be willing to bet that if you asked all those people who had their money in the 401k plans, do you really want Larry Fink to vote in favor of 91% of these proposals? You'd get a little bit of pushback, right? So in voting power without responsibility or risk, Professor Carmel highlighted the problem of empty voting. Right? And what she said is empty voting is the exercise of voting power by people with little or no economic interest, people without skin in the game. Right? And she warned that empty voting is potentially dangerous. It's dangerous for corporations. It's dangerous in terms of accountability. It can lead to bad decisions. Now, of course, Professor Carmel um, was not talking exactly about BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, State Street. She was talking about hedge funds, hedge funds that were exercising voting power for, in some cases, very selfish reasons, reasons that were directly opposed to the interests of shareholders who were long the company's stock. But she also warned, you know, that this idea that an agent, that an asset manager will do the right thing for a company that's a little bit of, that, that, that's, uh, uh, what, Jack, what did you say? It's a little bit of an optimistic view, right? We can't be sure that institutional investors are going to get it right. We, Roberta has pointed to failures of institutional investors with respect to things like uh, executive compensation. Um, more recently, there's a bunch of empirical literature that suggests institutional investors and their sort of automatic rejection of staggered boards. That might not be sensible as well. Institutional investors can make mistakes. And it also um, is, is problematic for institutional investors to make these mistakes in situations in which their authority to exercise judgment isn't something that's, that's, that's clearly part of their delegated role. So when um, institutional investors, for example, purport to be voting on ESG, purport to be defending stakeholder interests or portfolio interests or societal interests, I think we have to ask the question, well, has anyone really given them this power, this authority? And if the uh, asset managers are making these judgments. Can, be sh can we be sure, can we be confident that they are doing it in the interest of even what they think is in the best interest of their uh, beneficiaries, or are they acting selfishly? Are they promoting their own interests, right? Um, so here are some potential reasons to be concerned about that last question, agency costs, right? Big mutual fund sponsors, Larry Fink, may promote things like ESG, 
for a variety of different reasons, right? It could be to increase profits for shareholders, could be to increase firm specific profits if you do well by doing good. It could be to increase profits of the overall portfolio, but it could also be to sell mutual fund shares, right? Larry Fink gets a lot of publicity. People pay attention to BlackRock. It enhances the firm's reputation, right? Is that necessarily in the best interest of BlackRock shareholders? It could be to charge higher fees. Um, some newspaper articles recently report that these ESG funds can charge higher fees than standard or than low cost index funds. It could be to promote or, or, or to, um, I'm, I'm being told that I have three minutes, sorry, I can't pay attention to two things at one time. Thanks though. Um, it could be to attract the, a second set of agents, the people who select funds and fund sponsors for 401k plans. I'd be willing to bet that my employer, the University of Pennsylvania, finds an, a fund manager's voting policies on ESG and sustainability issues very attractive in deciding which um, sponsor, which funds to include in our 401k plans. It could be that the big asset managers who are getting so big and powerful are concerned about regulatory oversight about efforts to break them up for antitrust or other reasons. And maybe seeming to be good corporate citizens is a way of avoiding that kind of regulation. It could be that these funds are acting in accordance with the political preferences of the fund managers. Um, it could be that this furthers the political ambitions of individual fund executives. Uh, I haven't heard any announcement that Larry Fink is running for mayor of New York, but, you know, it's a crowded race. Uh, why not have one more person enter the fray? Um, it could be all of the above. So why do we worry about all of this? Obviously, this list of reasons suggests a number of dimensions in which a mutual fund manager might be engaged on an issue in a way that's different and even detrimental to the interests of the beneficiaries in that mutual fund, right? Now, since my time is short, right, let me just identify some of the polarization that we see in the country, some of the reasons why those mutual fund beneficiaries might have different views than the portfolio managers, right? Um, and, right, this is a treacherous path. This is a treacherous path for corporations, and this is an even more treacherous path for asset managers, right? And a former student of mine has a delightful paper where he talks about it isn't just an issue of disagreement, but keep in mind, many mutual fund investors are in these funds uh, through default in their 401k plans. They haven't even made a conscious choice. And now the company in which they are invested is essentially speaking out on political issues in a way with which they disagree. So very quickly, what can we do about this, right? I've got like a minute left, all right? One thing we can do is we can limit institutional investor voting. We can say, okay, you know, we, we're not gonna have the big three vote at all. We'll take away their power. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. I think Jack's right. In many cases, they are using their power for good, but maybe not always. Dorothy Lund wrote a paper a few years ago suggesting, you know, maybe it's not such a great thing for them to have this voting power. We could limit the scope of shareholder democracy itself. We could walk back the trend to expansive uh, uh, po political shareholder proposals and so forth. We could limit the effect of disinterested shareholder voting approval. I don't think we're going to go in that direction, although the uh, changes that the SEC made to 14, Rule 14A8 just before the change in administration are maybe a step in that direction, but that's a possibility. We could give mutual fund beneficiaries more say in how their shares are voted, right? And a number of people have, this, this has been a proposal that's around for a long time. A number of people have said, oh, okay, there's blockchain, there's technological advances. Uh, we could really, this is really practical and cost effective in a way that it wasn't practical 20 years ago. I think that's right. Um, but I think retail investor disinterest, low turnout, is unlikely to make this a particularly effective tool. 
Right now, there are other mechanisms for retail investor input. Sean Griffith and I are working on a paper in which we explore the possibility of retail investors not voting, but expressing preferences, providing some sort of input to mutual fund managers, which I think would help. But the final possibility, which I think is quite realistic, is product specialization. So uh, Roberto Tallarita has a paper in which he says, you know, the people who invest in ESG mutual funds actually care a lot more about ESG issues than other retail investors. So why shouldn't we see the choice of product as a way for retail investors to um, exert their preferences and have tolerate some variation in the level of stewardship that mutual invest mutual funds engage in. In other words, the Vanguard ESG fund can say, okay, it has a mandate from its investors to vote in favor of ESG. The Black BlackRock S and P P five hundred index fund not so much, right? So I think this product specialization might be the way to go and. It gives investors the opportunity to vote with their feet. If investors want what Jack is describing, they can do that by investing in mutual funds that will make that commitment. I'm out of time. I'm already over time. Uh, as I said, this is a preliminary paper. Um, I found Roberta's work really inspirational in thinking about some of these you know, very hot topics, these current questions, and I welcome everybody's input. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jill. Um, so our final paper presentation will be by Professor Joan Hemingway. Thanks so much, Dana, and thanks so much, Jack and, and Jill, for those thoughts. Um, I'm, uh, I'm privileged to be on this panel, and like everyone else, I am just thrilled and honored to be invited today. Before I get to my paper, I'm going to use the privilege of the podium to just say a word about Roberta. Um, and, and in, a, in a way that I don't think anyone else yet that I've heard has, has commented on her, I want to speak to her, um, her ability to teach and influence students not at Brooklyn Law, but at places like the University of Tennessee College of Law. And I have a very specific story in that regard that's probably unknown to many of you, but um, Roberta was our commencement speaker. We call it a hooding speaker, which I, we had a good conversation about that, Roberta, as I recall at the time. Um, but uh, for uh, 2009. And the way that came about is that one of my students was very inspired by Roberta's work and was on the nominating committee for our speakers for commencement for that year and nominated Roberta and she was selected um, by the nominating committee to come. She gave uh, a wonderful presentation based on her career. It's something I will never forget. And it's something that that student who, um, Roberta, you may be interested to know, did not go on in securities regulation specifically, but she did become a franchise lawyer, including uh, the general counsel of, of uh, Dickie's, the barbecue firm, for a bit. Uh, and she's now working in a private firm environment again, doing the same and advising business clients every day. And she recalls you um, with great fondness and was so proud to have you, as was I, um, as our speaker that year. So um, just to show you Roberta's influence extends well beyond the academy um, well beyond her influence through the Securities and Exchange Commission, but to, um, to students everywhere through her work um, and through her life. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that before I start tearing up. Um, I focused on, on one of Roberta's papers in my paper, uh, specifically her 2005 article, Realizing the Dream of William O. Douglas, the Securities and Exchange Commission takes charge of corporate governance. And I'm not sure if Roberta even realizes this, but in reflection, and I, I started my, my draft abstract for this with this thought, we were simultaneously working on the federalization uh, of corporate governance. Um, uh, I also had a 2005 article that came out. Mine was a little bit more pointed and related to um, what considerations we should use for institutional choice when we do federalize corporate governance. Um, but Roberta's article, which I'll speak about for a few minutes before launching into um, my, I'll call it a, an update maybe of the same, uh, although I hope it to be more than that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take it just a few minutes to, to talk about her piece, but it does, it does relate to my piece. And I, as I reflect on it and think about our parallel work in that time, it, it does make me smile just a wee bit. Um, so Roberta's article um, was, uh, was written about, as is obvious, I think, from its title, 
William O. Douglas's uh, vision of corporate governance regulation through federal securities regulation. And she executes the article in three principal parts for those of you who haven't read it recently or at all. Um, in the early part, she talks about the history of corporate governance uh, before Sarbanes-Oxley. Uh, and, uh, and William O. Douglas, of course, because he was a, an early chair, uh, late 1930s member of the commission, uh, commissioner and, and also chair uh, for a bit, um, was really in it sort of at the beginning of federal securities regulation. Uh, and she, it's a wide ranging history. I fa- find it fascinating to just read and reread. Uh, for some of you who are interested in this topic, you might, may find the same. So after she um, after she goes through that historical presentation, she identifies uh, and assesses eight different aspects of Sarbanes Oxley that altered pre existing corporate governance rules and norms. Um, and I won't bother to list those eight here, uh, but they all are formative to some of the thoughts in my piece. And so I'll pick up some threads from them. They include some obvious things like accountant regulation and attorney regulation. Uh, and uh, protections for whistleblowers, which I'll say a bit about in a minute. Um, but they, they all also include um, things like, you know, changing the, the structure and composition of corporate boards, things that we think about maybe um, uh, more in a, a business associations class than a securities regulation class. Uh, and then before concluding, she outlines four implications of Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, and refers to specifically larger facets of corporate governance regulation in that aspect. And I'm going to come back to those because I'm actually also going to conclude my piece. I'm basically mimicking in some ways the structure of Roberta's work uh, in bringing things forward just a little bit. Um, her concluding observations actually uh, maybe unsurprisingly from the title portend a potential, maybe even likely depending on how you read her words, sea change in corporate governance uh, an increase, obviously, in federalization that's consistent with Douglas's uh, overall regulatory dream, which I'll put in quotes. Um, and uh, and so what I do in my essay is I provide some insights into the extent to which and the manner through which the Securities and Exchange Commission has been able to exercise that leverage, focusing on some things that have happened in the intervening time since Sarbanes-Oxley. And then I'm going to take those four insights that Roberta had and and have my own insights on them. I fear that they will get to be a little bit broader than that, but I'm trying to constrain myself in a little bit to the four factors that that she talked about, which I'll come back to in in a brief moment. So what about corporate governance changes since Sarbanes-Oxley? I'm sure we could all come up with our own list. And and I I should probably say at the outset, something that I think is implicit in Jack's presentation and in Jill's presentation and, and perhaps in many others that, uh, that have been done before and will be done after, which is that Roberta recognizes a broad definition of corporate governance, which I subscribe to as well. Maybe it's why I'm, I gravitate to this paper so much. Um, and with it, she also recognizes the capacity of corporate finance and securities law Uh, not just the principles of the law, but the tools and the mechanisms of of those laws, things like disclosure regulation, uh, things uh, things like uh, capital formation regulation uh, to impact corporate governance. The the capacity for that is always there. Um, And so for some of you, this may be stretching your vision uh, of of corporate governance a little bit. Anyway, for the moment, I have picked uh, five areas of inquiry that I think um, or five things that have happened since Sarbanes-Oxley that I think are uh, important to think about. Uh, and I'm going to go through each one and just highlight a couple of, of top-level things so as not to overextend my welcome here. Um, so the first one is the, the 2005 SEC public offering reforms, which may seem like an unlikely choice. But here are the things that I think about in that regard uh, and that I want to say a few words about in the paper. First of all, issuer classification as a constraint on board action. So, you know, uh, are you a WIXI? Are you not a WIXI? What does that mean for you? And what does that mean about the board's choices for capital raising and how they execute their business? And what about the gun jumping and communication deregulation that's, that's also part of, of those public offering reforms? They certainly constrain the way that the board communicates things and the way that management uh, under the supervision of the board communicates things to suppliers, to shareholders, 
Uh, you know, you want to have maybe a routine so that you can take advantage of rules 168 and 169, or, you know, you might, um, you might want to, uh, plan 30 day communications, you know, before your uh, offering goes out. So I think there are lots of ways in which the board's activities are affected by those 2005 offering reforms. And I should note also that one of the tools that Roberta talks about in her paper that's relevant to this peace of mind is tinkering with liability provisions. To what extent uh, do evolutions in the liability provisions under the federal securities laws either better constrain board malfeasance or constrain it less well, keeping in mind here the concept that derivative litigation and in my M&A world, appraisal rights litigation uh, and securities uh, litigation are the three ways really that enforcement um, uh, powerfully constrains board activities. Um, so I'll say a few words on, for example, um, 12A2 and, and 17A2. Uh, of the 1933 Act and Rule 159, and and maybe make some re some references in that regard that come from the 2005 offering rules. Um, then I want to talk, and and this one's obvious, I think, about Rule 14A11. I'll call it the Rule 14A11 experiment. Um, uh, Roberta's paper does cover proxy access. Uh, obviously, it was drafted in 2005. The SEC's final rule, 14A11, wasn't adopted till 2010. And in fact, uh, then, of course, was vacated a year later by the D.C. Circuit in 2011. Uh, but interesting developments beyond that that one can report on and reflect on in this regard, I think, are the voluntary adoption by a management and shareholders of uh, more widespread proxy access, um, especially in the S&P 500. Uh, and so uh, I think there's there's definitely something more worth saying there. Then, of course, there's Dodd-Frank. Um, we could go through 5,000 things in Dodd-Frank that impact corporate governance. Uh, there are some obvious things, of course, like Section 951 uh, requiring advisory votes of shareholders on executive compensation and golden parachutes, uh, which has been alluded to earlier in this morning's program, Section 954's uh, direction from the commission uh, to provide uh, um, uh, for, uh, for listing uh, for stock exchanges to delist issuers that have not developed and implemented compensation clawback policies. And then there are all the disclosure rules, you know, disclosure on executive uh, compensation consultants, uh, about other compensation matters, about whether directors and employees are permitted to hedge any decrease in market value of the company's stock. I mean, we could go on and on and on, right? There are all kinds of interesting corporate governance ramifications of, of Dodd-Frank from 2010. Fast forward two years uh, to uh, the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. As many of you know, I've done a bunch of work in the crowdfunding space, but even the categorization of emerging growth companies and giving them a break on such things um, as uh, disclosure obligations has impacts on corporate governance, uh, as well as capital raising choices. Uh, the crowdfunding exemption from the 1934 Act periodic reporting um, uh, requirements, you know, not counting uh, Crowdfund Act investors in that regard, obviously has corporate governance ramifications. And uh, there's also the introduction under the Crowdfund Act of a new federal private right of action under Section 4A, subparagraph C of the 1933 Act, um, which captures not only issuers in the sense that we commonly think of them under the 1933 Act, but also officers and directors uh, and other principles of the firm, as well as potentially, according to the SEC, the fundraising platforms that, um, that crowdfunding occurs through. And then uh, last but not least for me, out of the five things that I've picked is form selection bylaws um, and specifically the decisions uh, of the, the Northern District of California in the Lee case, uh, the Northern District of Illinois in the Boeing Seafarers Pension Plan case and the Salzburg case in Delaware over the last year um, that essentially have blessed form selection bylaws, including to the extent that they actually preclude um, uh, shareholders from bringing federal securities law actions that might otherwise be available to them. All right. So what about Roberta's four categories and how, um, how they relate to all of this? This is implications basically of the corporate governance changes uh, here. I'm saying since Sarbanes-Oxley, hers was uh, at the end of Sarbanes-Oxley. So where do we stand on all of this? Her first category is aggressive enforcement and overregulation. Anyone who was here for yesterday's uh, first panel 
we heard we heard a lot about that and Roberta's concern about that. And obviously, she's written a whole book about it. Um, and she raises a number of concerns in her paper. Um, I want to talk about uh, about some more current things. If you look, for example, at the 2020 annual report from the SEC's Enforcement Division, it notes that tips, complaints, and referrals are up, that the whistleblower program has finally been streamlined and appears to be taking off after a a somewhat rocky start, and she does talk about that aspect of Sarbanes-Oxley in her paper. The possibility of ramped up enforcement clearly exists, and the report from 2020 suggests that. So I'm going to refer to uh, not only some academic literature here, but to the SEC's own reporting of its enforcement activity uh, for purposes of, of that piece of the paper. Uh, her second category of impacts has to do with the, the very obvious thing, federalization of corporate governance, um, you know, has she says in her paper, has the vision of William O. Douglas finally been realized in Sarbanes-Oxley? The answer is not yet, but the groundwork has been laid. And here's what I mean by portending uh, a, a new future of federalized corporate governance. She obviously talks about the PCAOB, independent directors, uh, the potential for adversarial relationships to be created between the board and the CEO, um, and, you know, ask the question, how much of all of this is really beneficial to the national economy? Um, and so, of course, I have to, in that piece of the paper, reflect on uh, maybe a failed experiment, maybe still continuing in some people's eyes, but Elizabeth, Swar Elizabeth Warren's accountable capitalism push. I think that's going to be an important part of, uh, of that piece of the paper for me. The third category that Roberta focuses on is the effect of all of this on state law. And she suggests two possible impacts. Uh, one is over enforcement of state corporate governance law, and the other is the atrophy of state law. Uh, I see more over enforcement, um, although I welcome uh, people's thoughts on atrophies. Uh, obviously, the form selection bylaw decisions. Um, uh, seem to show a greater power for uh, state corporate governance law. Um, I'm going to look also at state fraud action. She raises the concept that maybe states will take over more of that. That's a possibility. I'm also mindful of uh, interstate crowdfunding as a sign that states will step in where the federal government leaves a void. Um, and even though that's not uh, significant maybe to corporate governance, it shows how states and in particular, Blue Sky um, Commissions, uh, which she mentions in her paper, can be more active in this space. Um, other things I'm thinking about, um, the again, the new misstatements and omissions liability under the Crowdfund Act, but it hasn't been extensively used, and also the rise of benefit corporations, which has already been mentioned this morning, as a new state governance model, as maybe not over-enforcement, but again, uh, a place where the states have started to um, demarcate new territory. Her last category um, is the shareholder primacy model on which, uh, on which um, Sarbanes-Oxley is based. And we've heard a lot about this already this morning. Um, her main point there is, is the same one that Jill and Jack have already uh, articulated quite well, which is the rise of the institutional investor in its various forms. Um, uh, the rise of the big three, uh, again, not mentioned in her paper, but clearly something one could see from that. Um, she reflects in this part of the paper on the dot-com bubble, uh, its creation and its burst, um, and, uh, and essentially says, you know, are these, these, this new group of shareholders well-equipped or ill-equipped to monitor the corporation coming out, as we've already heard a little bit more on the ill-equipped side? Um, so an obvious thing to add to this part of the discussion is, what about the GameStop investor? Even less well-equipped, right, uh, to handle things. Disclosure about the fundamentals of a corporation doesn't matter to them because they're playing more with the gamification of the securities markets. Um, and so despite the fact that, that federal law focuses extensively on, uh, on the disclosure of those fundamentals, although not exclusively, there clearly is great disclosure for GameStop investors in there too on the market. Um, and that's, that's part of what they're trading on. But the rise of bulletin boards and um, the social concept that relates to investing, I think is an important piece of things. So uh, I know that's a lot to reflect on in the paper, but, and it is inspired as I know uh, others have said very directly, as you can see by Roberta's work and very directly by her work in that paper. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over, I guess, uh, Dana to Minor, right, to try and make some sense out of these three papers. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Joan. Um, so fascinating presentations by all of you. I don't envy uh, Minor the, <laughs> the job of tying all those threads together, um, but a lot of wonderful work to work with. So over to you, Professor Minor Myers, and then I can see we will have some insights from Roberta. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to tie everything together, um, but uh, the comments I want to offer briefly um, are uh, going to fall into three buckets. The first is just some comments uh, on Roberta as a person, a mentor, and a friend. Um, then some general comments on Roberta's scholarship, and then some comments on the issues raised by the panel and how they fit, I think, with Roberta's scholarship. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about Roberta, the person, and in particular, the benefits one gathers from being in her vicinity. I had the enormous good fortune to begin my academic career as a colleague of hers, um, and a number of her many virtues made a deep impression on me, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them. Um, on paper, she's intimidating for the obvious reasons. But uh, in person, unlike many people, I think, she lives up to her press clippings. Um, and for this rookie law professor was a very inspiring example. Um, I've always admired the way that Roberta is devoted to her family, uh, but at the same time has managed to make incredible contributions in so many spheres. She has reminded me uh, of Bo Jackson, um, a, a name from the long past, but Bo Jackson was the first person to have a professional career at the same time in Major League Baseball and in the National Football League. Uh, so Roberta Carmel to me has been the Bo Jackson of uh, high level securities practice. As a scholar, she's been astonishingly productive. When I became her colleague, she was only a few years away from the publication of her magnum opus, the 1600 page retrospective which Amazon measures by its weight, which is over eight pounds. Um, for someone with that kind of scholarly output, you might imagine there's not left over, uh, not much time left over for everything else. But again, Roberta is amazing. And this informs her scholarship, but obviously her pathbreaking service at the SEC, but being a practicing lawyer, serving on corporate boards, um, uh, her work at PLI. Um, Doing so many things so well was, for this junior colleague, as intimidating as it was inspiring. Um, another thing that's always stood out to me about Roberta is her institutional commitment. Someone with that experience, with that stature, um, could focus on anything. Um, but she was constantly attending, in particular, to the business law center. The care that Roberta put into, say, the, um, the annual lineup of the breakfast speakers for the center is more than many law school faculty members put into their scholarship each year. Um, the extent to which she was focused on building institutional um, communities, focused on business law, on developing the next generation of practitioners and scholars and even leaders of the center has been amazing to me. And in particular, her dedication to students was um, a real lesson for me. I was in charge for a while of keeping track of all of the job searches of the student fellows at the center. And I learned to expect frequent calls and emails from Roberta on this topic. On jobs, she was all over things, asking for regular updates, offering suggestions, giving guidance, and strategizing about what employers to call and cajole in order to help the students. Um, I wanna say something about Roberta's scholarship and in particular what I've found inspiring about it. First, just her sustained commitment to putting ideas into writing and consuming the scholarship of others. It's easy to have ideas when you've done all the things Roberta has done, but it's hard to, for anybody to write them up in a systematic way. Um, and for someone of Roberta's statue, that stature, that's not the sort of thing most people are interested in doing, but Roberta just constantly does it. It's the product of a mind to me that doesn't lose focus and has insights that need to be shared. And she has embraced the academic's priority 
on scholarship. Very early in my time at Brooklyn, I attended an IBL conference and Roberta spied me there and at a break in the action came over to say hello. And she didn't mince words. She said, it's nice that you're here. And then she paused for a moment and said, but you should be at home working on your paper. Um, and this commitment to scholarship has always amazed me. And I hope, you know, I continue to try to emulate it. Um, a, a theme that I've always admired in her work is one Jill emphasized, which is her skepticism. She has no problem telling anyone they're wrong. Uh, she does not gain any satisfaction as far as I can tell from going with the flow. In person, the skepticism always begins with a deep exhale before she speaks. <sighs> well, that sort of thing. Um, but in writing, this has been embodied in taking a critical eye to received wisdom and ideas. Um, and her writing in particular on independent directors is a classic example and one that has informed my own work. Um, another striking thing to me about Roberta's scholarly interest is her curiosity and interest in new subjects. Um, to me, th that the, the classic example is her focus on international issues, how easy it would be for someone with Roberta's expertise on American securities regulation to just stick to everything she already knows. But Roberta has always been constantly interested in new puzzles and challenges and has sought them out throughout the world. Um, so uh, I, I think the, the kind of person and teacher and institutional citizen I am now is a product of being able to learn for a time at Roberta's elbow. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, so let me try and offer, I guess, one comment um, on everything that's been raised by John and Jill and Joan, and perhaps as a way of sparking some discussion. Um, a, a major theme of John and uh, Jill is on the rise of the big three uh, institutional investors and what role they should play in corporate governance. And in particular, how much, if at all, do we want to use the levers of corporate governance as a way of dealing with social issues that may have been inadequately addressed through more general public policy and regulation? The second issue on the panel here, growing out of Roberta's scholarship, is the growing role of the federal government in corporate governance. So I want to step back for a second and just think about um, what normative criterion we ought to use when we bring to these discussions. Um, and I'm going to offer a Roberta-inspired suggestion, the drawing from one of the SEC's traditional mandates one normative crit criteria we might use um, is how does one another one or another approach to ESG or to the federal role in corporate governance affect capital formation? This can be one useful frame. Obviously, there could be others for thinking about. You know, what do we expect from the big three? Um, my own intuition, I think, um, is similar to the one Jill outlined. Um, that you know, in the new world of the big three of large institutional investors, um, there might be pitfalls all over when we look to them, not just uh, for corporate governance, but for social governance. Um, and I'm not sure that the new approach to ESG uh, portends great things for the vibrancy of American capital markets. So if you imagine somebody with a new potentially profitable investment opportunity in say natural gas transmission or oil extraction, obviously, but it's easy to imagine ventures um, that aren't as obviously controversial now, but might down the road intersect uh, with something that's politically salient. Um, when somebody like that needs to raise capital, the public markets have always been um, you know, if not the important source, um, at least over the last 15 years, an important source uh, of, if not capital liquidity. Um, and I wonder about the marginal effect of this new ESG regime on the decision to go public. Uh, my hunch is that in many cases, it has a negative effect on the decision to go public. Um, and I struggle to see the circumstances where it might have a positive effect on the decision to go public. 
um, uh, the benefits that would accrue are, are, as far as I can tell, chiefly social. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I think the hard question is, is this a useful way of pursuing many of these goals or is it strictly just a second best substitute because we can't get um, the generalized policy we want from uh, to address the goals directly? Um, how much have we really solved if all of our, say, you know, problematic ESG companies simply are private and so are beyond the reach of um, Larry Fink um, and uh, the federal government's governance mandates? Um, so I, I will stop there. Um, and as always, I look forward to hearing Roberta's thoughts on all of this. Thank you, Miner. I'm sure all of us are anxiously awaiting Roberta's comments. So uh, don't keep us waiting anymore. Roberta, please Thank share you. your thoughts. Well, this entire conference has been wonderful, uh, overly flattering to me uh, with regard to my work. Um, but um, I want to say that this particular panel has been very thrilling and exciting to me because um, Jack and Jill and Joan are academics that I have seen develop over the years. I've read their work. I've been at conferences with them. I've had conversations when we were not in the pandemic and everything was on Zoom um, after and during the conference. And in fact, I, I remember distinctly a conference that Jack and I attended I, I, in Montana. And at some break in the proceedings, we were driving around this gorgeous mountain scenery. And Jack said to me, I guess we gave them what they wanted when they invited us to this conference. And I thought, yes, that's definitely what happened today is all three of you gave the people at Brooklyn what we wanted when we invited you to present these papers. They were interesting. Um, I certainly have to think about all of this, not only in terms of what you have suggested and also in terms of what Minor has suggested. Um, personally, I've always felt that one of the problems of relying on government to solve society's problems is that um, the public doesn't rely on the government to do this anymore. And, you know, if we had adequate government policies on climate change, uh, I don't think people would be pressuring Larry Fink and others to do something about this. I, I think as Miner said, it's, it's the second best solution and maybe it's not a solution. Um, and this has certainly been a very interesting and refreshing uh, list of suggestions as to what we ought to think about. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh, maybe I should write an article about all of this once I get a chance to really read your papers, because I found them uh, provocative, challenging, and I thank you very much for your presentations. Excellent. Thanks so much, Roberta. So we do have uh, about 15 minutes left in our panel. I don't know if any of our panelists might have uh, comments or questions for each other, but also we want to open it up to our audience um, who can submit questions through the question and answer feature on your screen. So uh, please, uh, please do so. And uh, while folks are organizing their questions in the q and I can call upon my colleague, Jim Fanto. Well, thank you all for the, your presentations. I just had one question for Jill then to get her thoughts on. Um, I mean, you talked about, oh, well, pass through voting for index funds. I know, you know, people have proposed it, um, but you've seemed to dismiss it in a way Whereas, you know, it seemed, you know, people wouldn't be interested, the retail sector wouldn't be interested. But I mean, what do you think? I, I think that if GameStop shows anything, the retail sector is quite interested in, you know, investment questions these days. And, you, and in a politicized environment, they might be particularly interested in politicized issues like social govern governance issues. 
And, you know, so, you know, you could see like a whole new world of even campaigns, uh, you know, on the voting within Vanguard or BlackRock. So I just, let, you know, want, wanted your views on that. And then the second point, I guess, you know, on Jax is, you know, which Jill brought up is, you know, you're always worried about ESG as if there's a unified vision of it. I mean, what if, what if everybody gets things wrong? I mean, I'll give an example, just, you know, that I, yeah, kind of a personal example since my son's like doing nuclear theory and getting a PhD in it. And he always tells me, oh, the environmentalists are just wrong about this. You know, I mean, one of the cleanest sources of energy is nuclear energy. It's a great transition one. And, but yet the environmentalists have decided they're against it. And, um, you know, and so maybe they'll vote down every, anything that, you know, promotes nuclear energy. So then, you know, you're, you're left worried about, uh, you know, again, who's setting the agenda and what if they're just radically wrong? So um, since you did that in order, I guess I should go first while Jack's thinking. Um, uh, great questions, Jim. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, one of I'm working on another project um, about GameStop and the sort of reemergence of retail investors. And one of the things that I think is very interesting is the potential both that social media and these uh, fintech uh, companies have for engaging retail investors, not just with respect to investing, but also with respect to voting. Uh, I don't think it's happening yet. Um, so I, I really think it is potential. One of the interesting things that I've learned is that some of these platforms, Robinhood in particular, does provide investors with the power to vote, not just uh, regular shares, but even if they own fractional shares. So one of the things that people haven't really talked about with respect to Robinhood and GameStop is this proliferation of trading in fractional shares. And that also sort of implicates the SEC's role in kind of structuring the voting process. But you're right, down the road, we might see more interest in retail investor voting. And I've written before on uh, pass-through voting, and that's really based on sort of historical state of the world, retail investors, even direct investors who own, um, you know, round lots and everything are voting at a tiny percentage um, compared to the institutional investors. But that situation could certainly change. Um, if I can uh, sort of take the uh, privilege of adding on to your question to Jack before I turn it over to Jack, um, I think the question is not just um, whether investors get these social decisions wrong, but also the fact that investors don't necessarily speak for society at a, as a whole. Even if we look at people who invest through 401k plans, right, it's roughly 50% of the US population. So even under the most vibrant form of shareholder democracy, shareholder democracy isn't the same as political democracy. And so I think that makes your question even harder. And I wanted to make it harder before Jack has to answer it. Okay. Uh, are you hearing me? Can I? Can we? Okay. Let yeah. me see. What, what unifies Jill and others is this concern about unaccountable power. We've never liked power to be unaccountable, and we should not want power to be unaccountable. But I would maintain that the big three are subject to more accountability than our most institutional investors and our more, most individual retail investors. We have to understand what's going on for the last 10 years. Since about 2000, there's been a major trend of individual investors moving their retirement assets from active funds, stock picking funds, to passive funds. Why? Because they learned, as they should have learned long ago, that they can't beat the market in an efficient market, and it's better to try to match the market. There was an inflection point hit uh, in 2019, when for the first time, the assets under management by passive funds, the big three and others, exceeded for the first time the assets under management by active funds, the fidelities and the like. That shows a change in the attitude of American investors. They wanted the approach they saw these funds taking. 
BlackRock has been the most aggressive in talking about climate change. And it's really only climate change and affirmative action on the board where BlackRock has been active. Otherwise, they tend to vote against shareholder proposals. They are probably succeeding. They are finding that clients like their approach. Clients are moving their money to a firm that is going to be a voice. Uh, we don't know how powerful a voice, but a voice for greater reform and climate change. Now, is ESG dangerous? Is it going to lead to the suppression of shareholder interests? There's already a good deal of economic research. I think it's led by Christian Luz at the University of Chicago. And he finds that those firms that without yet being subject to federal oversight or federal regulation on ESG are voluntarily increasing their ESG disclosures are reducing their costs of capital. He's got several papers dealing with reducing the costs of capital by making voluntary ESG disclosures. Why does this happen? I think this happens, or he suggests this happens, because the principal reform is reducing projected variance. You might see a climate risk hanging over the market, a huge risk, and the firms that make more disclosures reduce the variance, get to greater certainty, less uncertainty, which generally does reduce the cost of capital. Okay, so if there's a good side to ESG, and I think that uh, although I heard a lot of skepticism from this audience, I don't think you realize how rapidly it's coming. Gary Gessler is working around the clock to have strong ESG proposals soon. And I think John Coates is working with them and Europe is way ahead of us. But we are finding that uh, uh, in Europe, which I think will be leading, there already is mandatory ESG. And I think we're going to move to, first of all, mandatory sustainability review boards. That is, we have the FASB for a long time deciding what appropriate accounting disclosures are, and they've done very little about ESG disclosures. But we're now merging the U.S. Sustainability Review Board with European Sustainability Review Boards, and I think we're going to see some common metrics about sustainability. This will be very important, and I agree, it should be criticized, it should be challenged, it should be debated, but I think the institutional investors do not think that existing accounting principles are giving them adequate information about the sustainability risk and the climate risk that they are subject to. They have a reason to be interested in systemic risk. It's not the personal preference, the personal ego of Mr. Fink. It is rather that sustainability and systematic risk are what logically economics says these kind of firms should be interested in. They are interested and they're beginning to put their toes into the water but their toes are only partway into the water and only on two issues, climate risks uh, and uh, broader diversity on boards of directors. I'm not terribly worried about them doing too much in either of those fields. I think the danger is whether they'll do very little. There is also one last point, a counter reaction brewing. In the last days of the Trump administration from deep in its under bunker, it adopted rules at the Department of Labor that tried to say you couldn't vote for ESG proposals unless you had adequate research demonstrating that it would pay off immediately in dollars and cents. Uh, the Department of Labor, as soon as it changed, announced that it would not enforce those rules. Uh, but clearly, there was a political dynamic out there that adopted rules that would made ESG voting close to infeasible. Uh, now, instead, they have been repealed, but I expect that that issue is going to be in front of us and it will get hotter as we see new rules and new metrics appear. Okay, so my basic point is, while we should always be concerned about unaccountable power, I think we also should be concerned about management. Corporate management is paid to maximize the stock price, and that is uh, the goal that they respond to based on the current structure of executive compensation. Current stock price may not adequately incorporate long-term systemic risk. That is the view of these new accountability research proposals. So I think that there is a reason to say we need to have some oversight because managers have at least as many bad incentives as do these new big three universal investors. Okay, the debate will continue. My point is, I think we are seeing the marketplace respond to the preferences of shareholders. 
who no longer want to beat the market, they're happy to invest with a, a, a BlackRock if it's simply going to match the market. And matching the market is a very attractive return over recent years. We're also seeing product specialization. Jill called for it. I think product specialization is coming because these uh, major firms, the big three themselves, are in intense competition. And some of them take a stronger position with regard to ESG than others. And I think some of them get a reaction with money moving to them. Essentially what the big three are, are not mutual funds. They are asset managers. They get pension funds to give them a portion of their portfolio. So a big public pension fund says, I like what they're saying over there at BlackRock, and I'm going to move 15 or 20% of my portfolio to their management. That is how the market rewards success, and that is what people are looking at when they make proposals and suggest that they are going to lead the field in this area. Okay? Uh, market mechanisms are in the background and doing probably more work in terms of how investment funds flow than anything that's in the law, Sarbanes-Oxley or Dodd-Frank together. So basic points, I think there is a good deal of accountability. Maybe there should be more. And I think product specialization is already here. And I think ESG is uh, responding to the desires of most investors, particularly in Europe, but also in the US. And there is a dangerous counter reaction out there as we are seeing corporate managers go underground and try to lobby the White House or other administrations to make sure to try to curtail the amount of voting that can be done for ESG causes. That's my short response. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to uh, use my moderator's prerogative. There are a bunch of other questions I know that have an ESG focus, but I want to uh, make sure we have a chance to uh, engage a little bit on Joan's paper before we finish up. I was struck um, in the uh, in the abstract that I read, as well as your presentation here, uh, Joan, on uh, how you're pointing to the federalization, but also invigoration on the state level in particular areas. And I wonder if you might say a little bit more about how you see the likely development in terms of what will happen on the federal side. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about federal side from this ESG perspective. Um, where do you see the, the states going? Uh, it doesn't sound like you think they will entirely atrophy. Um, and how can they function in a way to provide an alternative to uh, federal regulation or perhaps an inspiration? It's a great question. Um, and so uh, I think anytime they act, they may provide an inspiration or an instigation to, um, to federal regulation. They're not prepared to lose their turf. Nobody is. You know, the SEC doesn't want to lose its turf uh, and the states don't either. And the, the big power that they have, as has been mentioned already, is in the non-public company space, depending on how you define public. Right. Because one of the things of the, that relates to the Crowdfund Act is that we have public companies that don't have the same public reporting responsibilities, as I alluded to in my talk, that we had before. Um, and I guess where this all ends up is that um, William O. Douglas's dream will never be realized, I think, in the way he wanted it to. Uh, I don't see Elizabeth Warren's um, success in her federalization of corporate governance either happening anytime soon. And the states will keep fighting back as long as the judiciary allows them to, to continue to take some, some turf uh, that the federal government thought it had. Um, so there's, I think there's going to be this tension uh, that's inherent, which is, again, one of the reasons why I love Roberta's work in this space, because I think she sees it from a practitioner standpoint, from a regulator standpoint, and I spent a lot of time with the judicial decisions. And so um, she's, uh, she's looking at it, I think, from all of the right perspectives. So my conclusion will be that William O. Douglas's dream may be marginally sort of two steps forward, one step back, um, uh, moving in a direction. But I don't think we'll ever reach maybe his end goal in that regard. And Roberta may disagree with this, um, but, but that's where my head is at right now. I'm still digging like, like Jill, uh, my paper is still very much a work in process. And so if Roberta or anyone else has thoughts on this, they should feel free to 
to reach out so that I can incorporate them. Um, but as somebody who, like Roberta, cares about the institutional aspects of things, I think there's a lot more to think about here. I love the ESG discussion, and I hope to work some of the, the thoughts of my co-panelists into my paper as well. Um, but And I think mine are just to your point. I wouldn't just focus on capital formation, Roberta's work and, and mine will also focus on how all of this interacts with the protection of investors and how all of it also interacts with uh, the integrity of the market, uh, which I think has, there, there's some capacity for damage there uh, in a lot of aspects that we need to consider. So I hope that responds at least briefly to your question, Dana. Thank you so much. So uh, we are uh, out of time and with apologies to uh, some other ESG questioners that uh, I know will continue that discussion. Nothing could be more fitting tribute to Roberta's scholarship than uh, that people want to continue the discussion. She's always been someone to connect ideas and people, and I'm sure the connections made in this panel and at this conference uh, will continue to do that. So I just want everyone to remember we have a short break now, and our next panel will begin at uh, 1115 on market structure and I look forward to seeing uh, all of you there. Thank you so much. All right, so I will uh, do some talking uh, uh, and uh, as, as there are many nice things to say about Roberta, all true and appropriate, uh, so true is uh, so too for our panelists. So welcome to panel four, uh, securities market structure. Uh, and I just wanna mention uh, in brief before we get started that uh, there's going to be a break between this panel and the next, uh, so uh, we'll reconvene at two, um, and uh, you will know what to do in that break. Uh, so I'm going to run through uh, a little bit of the information about the people you'll be hearing from, uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the panel and how it's going to go, and then we will dive in. So first, James Fanto is the Gerald Balin Professor of Law and the co-director of the Center for the Study of Business Law and Regulation uh, at BLS. He teaches courses on banking, broker-dealer law and regulation, compliance, corporate and securities law, corporate finance and comparative and international corporate law and governance. He's the author of several books, including broker-dealer law and regulation. Um, he uh, has published many law review articles. He is also an associate reporter on the American Law Institute's project entitled Principles of the Law, Compliance, Risk Management and Enforcement. Uh, before his <laughs> Time in academia, he practiced banking, corporate and securities law with Davis Polk. Uh, and even before that, he was a law clerk to Judge Lewis Pollack um, and also to uh, Justice Harry Blackman of the US Supreme Court. Uh, he's been Roberta's colleague for uh, more than 25 years, uh, which is uh, even more than me. Uh, next, and this is alphabetical order uh, from here on out, <clears throat> but not the order they'll be speaking, uh, W. Hardy Colcott, uh, who is a partner at Sidley Austin and a former SEC uh, Assistant General Counsel. Uh, now he currently practices uh, on enforcement defense and regulatory counseling concerning securities markets and regulatory issues for broker dealers, investment advisors, mutual funds, and others. Uh, as far as securities enforcement defense before the SEC, Department of Justice, FINRA, and other SROs. Uh, he is a member of Sidley's Global Securities Enforcement and Regulatory Practice, uh, which has been showered with praise and awards, including the 2019 Chambers USA Award for Financial Services Regulation Firm of the Year uh, and the 2020 Chambers USA Band One for Financial Services Regulation and Broker Dealer. Uh, he served in the General Counsel's Office, as I mentioned. He was Assistant General Counsel for Market Regulation, which is now trading in markets. Uh, and he was also at Charles Schwab as Senior Vice President and General Counsel. Uh, Annette Nazareth, uh, currently senior counsel with Davis Polk and former SEC commissioner uh, and former director of trading and markets. Uh, she is currently a senior counsel with Davis Polk. She previously headed the firm's trading and markets practice in the financial institutions group. Um, and uh, she, uh, in addition to being a former SEC commissioner, she's just been a key player in the financial services industry uh, regulatory reform for many years. Uh, she joined the SEC staff in 1998 uh, as senior counsel to Chairman Arthur Levitt, and then served as interim director of the Division of Investment Management. Uh, she served as director of the Division of Trading and Markets from 1999 to 2005, when, as you will hear, much happened. Uh, as director, she oversaw the regulation of broker-dealers, securities exchanges, and clearing agencies. And she also served as a senior staff member assisting the SEC chairman 
on the president's working group on financial markets. Uh, and she was appointed by President George W. Bush uh, in 2005 to be an SEC commissioner. Last but not least, we have Eric Reuter, who's a lecturer at Boston University and also a senior vice president, general counsel of Fidelity, or is retired as a senior vice president, uh, general counsel of Fidelity Management and Research, and also a former SEC assistant general counsel. Eric served at the SEC from 1976 to 1981 starting as staff attorney in the Division of Market Regulation, now Trading and Markets, moving to the Office of General Counsel where he served as Assistant General Counsel. Eric moved to the firm of Devil Boys and Plimpton in 1981, becoming a corporate partner in 1985. In 1997, he left Devil Boys to accept an offer from Fidelity um, <clears throat> and was its General Counsel uh, until he retired in 2008. And since 2008, Eric has been lecturing um, at Boston University teaching courses to JDs and LLMs in corporate governance, corporations, financial services, regulation. Um, and he's also been an adjunct professor at BC uh, teaching a course on mutual fund regulation. So now I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what uh, the next hour plus will look like. Uh, Jim is gonna kick things off with a brief talk about Professor Carmel's views on the transformation of the self-regulatory organizations. Uh, Annette will follow with her views on these issues and then how market structure remains a continuing challenge for the SEC. Um, Eric will then speak about his experience in writing with Roberta. Uh, finally, Hardy is going to discuss uh, the current market data focus uh, and its ties to Roberta's insights. Uh, and then we're gonna hopefully open it up if we have time uh, to a conversation among ourselves and the participants uh, who will include former SEC folks uh, and we will yeah, we'll get that done. And I just wanted to uh, indulge myself by saying one more thing. Um, I, so the, the, my most important role on this panel is to be silent, but I will say one thing. Roberta Carmel, uh, I still remember getting a phone call from her in the fall of 2003, inviting me to interview with Brooklyn Law School. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history, uh, but I, can, I have a clear vision of where I was sitting when I got that call, um, and it just has changed my life, and I'm so grateful to Roberta for inviting me to join this incredible community. All right, so I'm gonna hand the reins over to Jim and he will talk for 15 minutes. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Stephen. Let me just put up a slide. One sec. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so I hope you can see it there. Um, my talk's entitled, as you see, Professor Carmel and the Transformation of Self-Regulatory Organizations. And there you have you know, a picture, that, a photo when she was on the commission and seated as we saw to the far right. Uh, now, the, what I'm going to talk about is the subject that this, transformation of self-regulatory organizations, which drew Roberta's scholarly attention, particularly in the early 2000s. And she brought to these events her, um, her perspective, which was kind of a unique perspective. Is she someone who has uh, had a good sense of self-regulatory organization history? an extensive ex ongoing experience in securities regulation and practice. Now she, and I'll talk about this, she offered no overarching theory, but I think during this time, she pointed out issues and problems and contradictions in this transformation that would, would have to be addressed by Congress and the SEC. Now I thought I'd say something about you know, self-regulatory organizations, but I looked at all the, all the participants and don't seem to have students here. Uh, you know, so for the most part, you know what's going on because you're all experienced securities and corporate law people. But, you know, we do remember that the federal securities law were built upon self-regulation because it existed before the federal securities laws came into uh, being. And which essentially meant that the marketplaces regulated the conduct of the broker dealers and others who were their members with respect to their conduct and their legal compliance. Now, what am I going to do? I'm just going to first just remind you 
of the events that she discussed, just outline them. And then I'm going to talk only about her major academic writings on the transformation. I'm not gonna cover her practice-focused writings. And then, then I intend to highlight just a few observations she made on the transformations at the time and talk about maybe their relevance for today. And then I'd like, you know, I'm really there to tee things up to those other panelists who will develop, uh, you know, will address the historical context. And, you know, kind of who better, you know, here's a picture of, uh, you know, Annette, who's going to talk. And I mean, what better person could you have a former commissioner, former director of what's now called trading and markets. And as you see, you know, with the other, you know, former commissioners there. And I apologize, you know, to Eric. I said, look, I looked all over for a picture with you and Roberta, but I couldn't find one. And Eric, you know, I always know Eric because he's such a specialist in invest, investment advisor, investment company issues. But when we were preparing this panel and the whole conference, he said, hey, I know all about broker dealer stuff, too. And I'd, I'd like to, you know, weigh in there because of his, of, uh, his background with Roberta. And then of course, Hardy, who, you know, you got the introductions, but he's kind of a household name in this area. And, you know, a practitioner that everyone always thinks about, you know, and a real specialist. So it'll be good to hear, hear what they have to say about the kind of the, the issues I raise. So that's just remember what the transformations were. Uh, I mean, maybe it started in 1975 when the Securities Act amendments of 1975 that just, you know, to summarize briefly, set forth the structure of the national market system and gave the SEC much more power over the exchanges and the securities associations. And in the years following, you know, you have all these SEC regulatory developments really implementing the national market system. Now, at the, and, you know, and then if you look here, you have, in 1998, you have this adoption of regulation ATS, but that, that, would, that came after all this work and all this development of these trading systems that worked in conjunction or sometimes in opposition to, to the exchanges. So, so again, you have the law setting forward, you have other regulations, but what you also, you know, you have the SEC at this point saying, oh yes, the exchanges are transforming, they're getting competitors in this uh, trading space. And we're aware that it poses problems of fragmentation. And, but the exchanges then were transforming themselves because technology had changed and they were developing their own trading, electronic tape trading capabilities throughout the, the 2000s. And then, you know, another big regulatory milestone is in 2005 with Reg N NMS complicated regulation, but this, you know, simplified, you know, highlight tries to have linkage between markets, particularly to protect investors, you know, protect them and so that they can get at least the market price and not, not be pushed aside to substandard pricing. Now, as the, as the transformation goes on, you have maybe pushed by technological demands, the <clears throat> stock exchanges then become public companies. They needed to raise capital, but then that posed an issue too. Well, what about, I thought they were self-regulatory organizations. They regulated their members. So what you get is this split where the self-regulatory part of the exchanges splits off, or at least put is set aside as, you know, as in the case of NASDAQ, it becomes an affiliate. So you, so you, you know, you started with an exchange that was doing this self-regulatory activity, but then you get the split during this period. And then ultimately what you get is this creation of FINRA, which is a combination of the New York Stock Exchange and the NASD's regulatory side. Now, what I, what I show here is I thought, well, it might be interesting just to look at 
Roberta's career. Now, this is her practical, you know, her practice side in the events that I just highlighted. So that, you know, you see, of course, she was commissioner right after the 1975 amendments. And while a lot of the regulatory activity was beginning, she was also on the New York Stock Exchange board, you know, before it deemed mutualize. And you also see her there as a member of the NAC, you know, which is the adjudica adjudicatory council for the NASD. And all the time now, you know, she was on the SEC staff, as you see, in 1962, and then in private practice in 1969, but that continues for 30 some years, except for the interlude, when she's SEC commissioner. So sure, her practice life, is right through this entire transformation. Now, now, my point is to talk about what she wrote about, you know, and I'm just highlighting her major academic writings. Again, it's kind of, kind of humbling because remember le yesterday, someone said, well, let's look at her writings on international stuff. And that was happening at the same time. Well, she's also writing, doing major work on the exchanges. And so you see here, she, she wrote an important article on the transformation of the exchanges, you know, their demutualization. In other words, the members are losing the governance role in the exchange. And instead what you have is exchanges becoming public and then separating out that regulatory side. Wrote about that. Also wrote about the implications now. Well, the exchanges are changing, and they're also becoming linked up with international exchanges. And what does that what does that portend? And now another important article, as you see in two thousand and eight, where she really looks at well, what are the implications of this? The fact that you get this self regulatory body, Finra, now that's it's no longer part of the exchange. You know, it's separated out. It's, it seems quasi-governmental. I mean, in other words, the brokers aren't regulating themselves. Now you have this specialized organization. And then finally, she has this piece in 2009, which is kind of, well, what, what about all, all these transformations happening to the market, happening to self-regulation? How is the SEC doing? Now, Again, look at, you know, I have another timeline here, which is what you see her writing with these events. And again, her writing kind of tails toward the end of the events. But remember how academic writing goes. It's, you know, you always, it takes, there's a lag in publishing. So essentially she's writing right when the exchanges are transforming, when FINRA is getting created. Now, let me just highlight in the time I have remaining just a few observations that she made, and I probably will just limit it to kind of the FINRA stuff. She was always a balanced critic of what was going on. She was never a cheerleader for the self-regulatory organizations, the exchanges, nor was she someone who just criticized, you know, them as being concerned only about their broker-dealer members. I think she understood that they were very much to blame for their loss of complete self-regulatory independence because of their, their repeated failures to uh, deal with anti-competitive practice, practices which spurred congressional and SEC action. But I think she also highlighted in her articles that the government you know, had weakened broker-dealer self-regulation starting in 1975. And she highlight, if you read through her article, she highlights this, this is what, you know, the government pushed the SEC to do, and that's what the SEC was doing. It was expanding its role in SRO enforcement itself. And now I would add, I don't think Roberta would disagree with this. I think a lot of the larger broker-dealers you know, this was a t the end of Glass-Steagall so that they could combine in financial conglomerates. And they, I think they became less interested in self-regulation for a host of reasons. Now, 
On FINRA itself, I think she made many important points because she said, well, was FINRA inevitable when public companies, when the exchanges became public companies that focused on shareholder profits in a world where many of their, their members were now part of financial groups and were in fact competitors with the exchanges, you know, competitors insofar as they were operating their own uh, alternative trading systems and doing internalization of order flow. Now, for Roberta, she said, well, I don't know, was it a new conflict? There was always a conflict between the interest of the exchange or its members profiting and and the exchange itself, you know, so why, the, why was the public company something, you know, the fact that they became public companies so special? And she thought, well, I'm not sure that explains it. She said, she said, well, I think the SEC had a vision of SRO governance, you know, which simply pushed the, the broker dealer members out of the picture or downplayed their role and highlighted more independent directors and, you know, and pushed the members and even the issuers who had a role before. And so it, I think for Roberta, FINRA was the inevitable outcome of this push, you know, this push that the, you know, that the, that the SEC was pushing and you get uh, something that starts to look like a federal securities regulator and that's what Roberta asked. You see, she said, well, is it any different from the SEC? And, uh, you know, as opposed to this former collection of, of individuals. Now, my time's coming to a close. I just want to say if, uh, uh, kind of a last thing about FINRA. And, you know, is there any self-regulation left, at least on this, this kind of broker self-regulatory side? And I, and I, you know, I think in the paper, I give a functional answer and, uh, you know, that Roberta might accept. And, and it's that, you know, I say, oh, firms still engage in self-regulation, but it's become it, it, it's become an internal issue. I mean, in other words, self-regulation got spun off from the exchanges and became specialized in FINRA. And you could give a functional answer, say, well, in this world of heightened uh, regulation and heightened specialization, you need a specialized self-regulator. But what happened to the self-regulation from the brokers themselves? And I, I would argue, well, it's there maybe somewhat in compliance in firms, just, you know, the firms themselves can't do self-regulation itself be because there's so many demands from regulation, but it's there in the firms in compliance. And <laughs> so what you have now is a collaboration between compliance officers and FINRA with the oversight of the SEC staff. And this is you know, and then you have compliance officers working closely with FINRA and the SEC. So it's kind of a weakened self-regulation. And, uh, but, you know, not what we saw before. Now, I think just in conclusion, I think what Roberta, what Roberta thought about SROs, particularly in this self-regulatory role, was that she... She valued the, the flexibility they brought to market circumstances, which is kind of a functional view. It's what I was, you know, what I was just highlighting. And this is what she highlighted in her articles. You know, it's, it's not like she's anti-government. She said, well, the SEC has a role, but the SROs were valuable with their flexibility. Uh, and she, she wanted that to continue. And so I say, well, maybe what we have now with the, height, the, the hyper-specialized FINRA and then compliance and firms, this is what we get. Now, yeah, and you know, and then FINRA is close to the firms and can administer, administer the SEC roles with respect to them. But Roberta also highlighted in her writing, she said, I don't know, you know, FINRA is 
looks very much like a government agency, and that raises contradictions on its status. And so she argued very much for it to retain its independence from the SEC. She wanted it to be an independent, non-political expert body. And I suppose the question, she wanted it to provide this, this what she saw as the advantage of self-regulatory organizations, this flexibility that came from the bottom up, you know, the, the market participants knowing what's going on. And I suppose, you know, what maybe she'll comment on later is, has this, you know, has this been achieved? Uh, ha have we retained this flexibility in this new self-regulatory uh, standard? But let me let me stop there because I've I've used up my 15 minutes and uh, maybe the the co my panelists co-panelists here they'll talk about this but they may also want to talk about the transformation of of the exchanges and and the fragmentation of the markets. So Stephen, let me turn things over back Thank to you. you. Thank, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, and now we're going to hand uh, the microphone. Do we still have those things? The microphone over to Annette. Um, thank you, Annette, for joining us. We really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this incredible honor uh, to be here today to reflect on the accomplishments of Roberta Cornell, and in particular, her writings and speeches on market structure. Uh, it's been a real treat to review so much of her scholarship uh, and to literally take a trip down memory lane on some of the most important issues of market regulation. And it will probably come as no surprise to you that what I've concluded from this exercise is that everything that's old is new again. The issues concerning market structure really have not changed. Uh, rather, they have reemerged in new ways based on changes in technology and business practices. But Roberta brings a rich perspective as someone who was there at the beginning when NMS wasn't Reg NMS, which I know, uh, but rather literally the new national market system that the SEC was charged with implementing under the 75 amendments. So it's undoubtedly risky to assert what I view as Roberta's overarching principles after reviewing these writings. Um, but um, particularly since she's here, <laughs> but uh, here it goes. And I hope that if I get any of it wrong, uh, she'll be merciful and uh, correct me later. Um, along the lines of what Jim was just talking about, I mean, I, I read uh, Roberta and her writings to say that she is a, a real believer in the merits of self-regulation. Uh, obviously, as Jim said, she's done a lot of writing on it and she has certainly um, had a nuanced view, particularly of the transformations. But she understands based on her uh, experience as a commissioner that the optimal way to regulate was to bring regulated entities into the regulatory process since they clearly had the relevant expertise to at least suggest approaches to solutions. In the late 1970s, SEC uh, Chairman Harold Williams said that the industry had to come up with a plan to implement the national market system. And this was, as, as Jim alluded to earlier, really a bottoms up approach to rulemaking in which the commission would approve plans developed by the exchanges if they were consistent with the mandate of the legislation. Uh, Chairman Williams believed that government had the uh, limited ability to get the implementation of the national market system correct on its own. And my sense was that Roberta also agreed with this sensible approach and that Overall, she's throughout her career been cautious about overregulation and what she has referred to as a command and control approach to regulation. Um, she didn't believe that regulation solved all ills. And indeed, she was sensitive to overregulation in any way thwarting innovation. 
uh, she has always called for a ban. I think it's really been remarkable to read Roberta's work and to see how relevant it is today and in many ways how prescient she was in identifying many of the challenges that we still face. Certainly at the top of the list is what we've talked about uh, today, which is self-regulation. As Jim noted earlier, she thought deeply about the evolution of self-regulation in the aftermath of the demutualization of the exchanges. She foresaw the increased conflicts between regulatory obligations and the for-profit uh, motives of public exchanges. Um, she anticipated many of the issues raised in the SEC's concept of SROs in the early 2000s. And she, I think, foresaw the split between member regulation and market regulation. And as we know, member regulation ultimately became centralized in FINRA and with market regulation either being performed uh, by the exchanges or being outsourced to FINRA. And she worried about what the impact of this further separation from the members and the significant changes in SRO governance would have on regulation. Uh, today, as we know, broker dealers and exchanges uh, do argue that the self has largely been written out of self-regulation. And they raise concerns that unlike when Berta was at the, on the commission, the SEC today orders SROs to fashion regulations to address particular market issues, yet in a much more prescriptive way concerning what the provisions would say. Uh, market data plans are a notable example of that, and I'm sure Hardy will have some things to say about that later. Um, this prescriptive approach in which uh, the SEC essentially dictates the provision is arguably a bit closer to command and control than uh, that Roberta had expressed some skepticism about. Uh, there are many other market structure issues that Roberta has focused on over the years that resonated with me as I reviewed her impressive body of work. Uh, these issues are directly relevant to my experience working on the NMS and also remain remarkably relevant today uh, as evidenced by some of the issues that Chairman Gensler spoke about in his uh, recent congressional testimony. For example, payment for order flow and internalization. That will be with us for a while. Uh, in her oral history for the SEC Historical Society, which I'm proud to currently serve as the president of, uh, Roberta spoke about the early debates at the commission on market structure. In the 1970s, the commission spent a lot of time focused on market fragmentation, and they fiercely debated the ever controversial central limit order book, or known as the CLOB. Roberta focused on the seemingly contradictory goals in the national market system legislation between fostering greater competition among stock exchanges and fostering economically efficient execution of securities transactions and the challenges that those contradictions posed. And of course, these contradictions remain. And as you know, Greg NMS, uh, as Jim alluded to, sought to maximize the benefits um, of both goals by ensuring that markets, uh, we had competing markets, but that they were linked, albeit in a much more technologically efficient way than the uh, antiquated ITS system uh, that uh, was put, uh, put out of its misery uh, to ensure that investors got the best prices regardless of where those uh, trades were executed. But looking to where we are today, Chairman Gensler has already indicated that he is focused on these issues. He's expressed concerns about the amount of trading that is affected off transparent uh, exchanges. He's raised concerns about payment for order flow and how it, he believes it may be siphoning orders from exchanges. And he's troubled by the inherent conflicts of interest that broker dealers have in directing orders to venues that provide the best rebates to the brokers. And he's raised concerns that these practices may not be consistent with best execution. And of course, as we all know, we really can't look at payment for order flow practices without also considering the companion issues of internalization, which is another issue that Roberta knows very well. 
Indeed, these are all issues that the commission has grappled with for decades. And as Roberta can attest, there are no easy solutions if one believes that solutions are necessary in any of these respects. It will be fascinating to see how the current commission will seek to address these issues. We'll see whether the current commission shares Roberta's full understanding of the nuances and the challenges of addressing these issues. Uh, few understand the nuances and the shades of gray as well as Roberta does. Another area where she has repeatedly focused uh, in the past is retail investor issues. The SEC's current concerns over retail brokerage practices and what others uh, today have called the gamification of trading is really right up Roberta's alley. She has expressed concerns in her academic writings on the failure of the SEC to really focus on encouraging uh, a greater focus on capital formation as opposed to uh, practices or, or sanctioning practices like you know, day trading, gamification, high risk strategies. And, and of course, these are areas uh, of concern even today. While Roberta hasn't suggested particular solutions to these issues, he, her focus on these issues uh, uh, and these practices are as important today as ever. Another, what I call, I told you so moment for Roberta, uh, relates to derivatives. Long before Dodd-Frank mandated the pervasive regulation of derivatives, Roberta was calling for bringing this multi-trillion dollar market into the regulatory fold. She lamented that Brooksley Bourne's efforts to regulate this market were stymied and that the collapse of long-term capital management almost brought the U.S. markets to its knees. Berta was concerned that not only were derivatives essentially unregulated and therefore exempt from margin regulation, but she was also concerned that many entities that traded them, namely the hedge funds, were also largely exempt from regulation as investment advisors. Indeed, she once referred to the Advisors Act as flimsy, and those are fighting words for Roberta, apparently. But of course, uh, we need only to fast forward to the recent, to the recent Arch, Archegos, uh, Archegos debacle uh, to fully appreciate the value of Roberta's scholarship on these issues. There we saw a family office, uh, in this case, exempt from advisor regulation engaged in massive derivatives trading, and Archegos uh, was engaged in total return swaps that while they're now technically covered under Dodd-Frank as uh, security-based swaps, uh, the margin rules were yet to take effect. So we saw billions of dollars in losses uh, when its concentrated positions turned negative. The losses have also shed light on crime brokerage practices and even stock lending an area that Chairman Gensler is now going to focus on. You may know that the SEC was given authority under Dodd-Frank to require greater transparency of stock lending positions, but heretofore has not used that rulemaking authority. So I see an opportunity here for Roberta to weigh in on yet another market structure issue, something new. There are so many more issues that Roberta has addressed over the course of her illustrious career. But I'd like to briefly, briefly focus on a topic that Roberta spoke about, and it's not market structure related, but it really resonated with me. And that's the issue of the revolving door. Again, this is a timeless issue that Roberta identified very early in her career. She spoke about it in a speech before the Securities Law Committee of the Federal Bar Association in 1978. So permit me to quote her here. She said, as a commissioner of the SEC, I am deeply concerned ab about how my ethical standards as well as my compliance are perceived by the public I was appointed to serve. I'm concerned about the current negative view of government employment and about the suggestion that outstanding leaders from the private sector will only enter private life for personal gain. Roberta spoke about the post-Watergate distrust of government. She noted that what we need is a sense of community between members of the public and government officials. Conflicts of interest are inevitable and need to be managed. But views being espoused that in order to avoid conflicts of interest between the public and private interests, that government policymakers should not be chosen 
from the ranks of the regulated were wrongheaded. Indeed, some advocate a more adversarial relationship between the business community and the government, in particular between regulated industries and their accountants and lawyers on the one hand, and the independent regulatory agency, such as the SEC. Um, and some believe that the regulatory agency would be sanitized if it could limit appointments to persons totally unrelated to the business community or regulated industries. So here are Roberta's words on this. She said, personally, I disagree with this view. The purpose of business regulation should not be to alienate and shackle the regulated, but rather to assure the optimum use of natural economic and human resources. The so-called revolving door by which individuals pass from private enterprise into the government and from public service to private business provides a constant renewal of talent for both sectors. Obviously, this does not seem to be the um, uh, current sentiment, but it, it is uh, one that I find refreshing and enjoyed going back and, and reading Roberta's thoughts on this. And to me, it also exemplified her innate passion and, and uh, sincerity in doing what was best for the, for the public, regardless of private interests. So thanks again so much for giving me this chance to uh, take this trip down market structure memory lane. Thank you. And do I turn it back to, to, uh, to our moderator? There you are, Steve. <laughs> Hi, yes, no, it was just, uh, you, your timing is so perfect. My timer went off just you started speaking, so I wanna make sure that was off before I muted myself. <laughs> um, so just, I, I'm, you know, I, it's, for somebody who's not an expert in this area, it's really incredible to hear more about, you know, I, I had some sense of Roberta's impact on the field, but to hear, hear it in such detail from people who know it so intimately is really just, just overwhelming um, and just really uh, just a privilege to hear. So thank you so much, Annette. Uh, now we're gonna hear from, from Eric. Uh, I look forward to hearing uh, uh, a, a different perspective. Thank you, Eric. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, different, hopefully, although so much of what's been said is, is what I would like to simply add my agreement to uh, about all of the wonderful uh, things that have been said about uh, Roberta. Uh, uh, as Jim said, I, I was first asked to take part in this conference on another panel, the one that deals with financial intermediaries and investment management in particular from my perspective, uh, given the time that I served as general counsel at Fidelity. And, and I said to Jim, well, I can do that, but my personal experiences with Roberta go way, way back to the time <laughs> that Annette was speaking of in the, um, in the Bronze Age when the Securities Act Amendments of 1975 still had wet ink on the page. And uh, I'd like to perhaps focus my brief remarks uh, about that particular moment in time. And Roberta, I will apologize in advance if my remarks are shorter than the remarks of others. Um, I think that uh, the brevity of my remarks, uh, I hope, will not be seen as any less intense in their respect and admiration of you. I sort of think of it as a fine single malt scotch. You, you don't want to dilute it by adding water or even ice cubes, you want to have it neat. And I'll try to keep my <laughs> remarks neat um, and to the point. Uh, so I did tell Jim that my wonderful, if somewhat brief uh, encounter with Roberta really uh, was way back in 1978 and I was a very young lawyer in the division of market regulation. And, and it was thought at the time that let's change the, let's change the name of that division from trading and markets, which seems so antiquated because of the Securities, Acts of Amendment, Securities Act amendments of 1975. 
it would sound more up to date to change the name to the Division of Market Regulation. And then, you know, years and years later, maybe Annette can educate me on this. Why it was decided to change the name back, I don't know. Anyway, so I was a young lawyer and there was somebody else that was new to the commission at the time, albeit at a much, much, much higher level, the highest you can get, and that is commissioner uh, because Roberta had just joined the um, SEC a year earlier in 1977. So um, again, um, I would say that unlike most, if not all of the speakers on the conference here, while I will speak glowingly about Roberta, uh, and I have known Roberta for a great stretch, stretch of time, I've not had the privilege of working with her over a great uh, span of time. Well, 1978 uh, is, I think, a very um, instructive point in time, perhaps, to speak about Roberta and uh, to speak more broadly about the work uh, and the milieu in which uh, Roberta has thrived over uh, so many years. Uh, of course, it was just within a year that she had been appointed to the commission as a commissioner. But with 1978, there is a certain symmetry as we sit here in 2021. Uh, because 1978 was 44 years after passage of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, uh, the first federal legislation to regulate the secondary trading markets and its professional players. And if we were to turn the clock back from today, 1978 was 43 years ago. So we're right in the middle of chronology, at least, if we take a look back uh, in nostalgic ways in 1978. But besides nostalgia, 1970, nostalgia, 1978 was very interesting because as Annette has said, the SEC was still in the very early stages of wrapping its arms around the Securities Act's amendments of 1975, and that legislation was extremely ambitious. I, I would compare it in some ways to the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act in that um, there had been many, many um, items on the uh, wish list of those who wanted to see improvements um, and an opportunity presented itself in 1975 as an opportunity presented itself in the aftermath of the financial meltdown of 2008 that led to Sarbanes-Oxley. And in both cases, uh, the answer that Congress came up with was, we'll take credit for whatever good comes out of this enormous delegation of authority that we're going to give to one or more agencies. Um, and of course, if things go badly, then we uh, will have maintained sufficient distance from the messy work of implementation that we have delegated. Well, um, in contrast to Sarbanes-Oxley, which delegated enormous responsibility to a great number of administrative agencies, uh, the 1975 Securities Acts amendments really were solely focused on having the SEC do all of the grunt work. And as we know, the thrust of that legislation was to modernize our securities markets that was then dominated, um, some might say monopolized by uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, at the heart of the NYSE's domination or uh, monopolization, if you will, uh, stood at the epicenter, the specialist system of the New York Stock Exchange. And the specialist system made, was made possible and uh, was made seemingly unassailable by two rules of 
the New York Stock Exchange. One was the rule that forbid any uh, NYSC member to act as a market maker on the floor of the exchange with the sole exception of the single specialist firm appointed to make a market in the stock of a particular company. And second uh, was the New York Stock Exchange off-board trading rule, which effectively banned any and all of its member firms from acting as market makers, indeed acting as principal uh, in the over-the-counter uh, market trading of any NYSE listed stock. Of course, we could also throw into the mix uh, fixed commission rates that had helped prop up the New York Stock Exchange until these, rate, these fixed rates were finally uh, eliminated in the 1975 uh, legislation. Um, well, what was my assignment for Roberta? Roberta, I would be shocked if you remembered this at all. And I, it, it would be okay for you to say, Eric, this was an interesting story. I have no recollection at all of this. But for me, it really uh, left such an impression on me as a young lawyer that to this day, I can look back at that experience and see how it helped form me and how it gave me confidence to deal with issues that were new and unfamiliar. Uh, there I was as a young lawyer at um, the Division of Market Regulation. I had just joined it within the last year or so. And I think, um, well, I had wanted a job in the Division of Enforcement, but they wisely decided not to give me an offer. And, and I think that was a good decision on their part, both from their standpoint and I think maybe from mine. So I wound up in Market Reg and um, my feet had just gotten wet when I uh, got an assignment. And I think it may have come from Kathy McGrath. I think she may have been the director of uh, Market Reg at that time. Um, in any event, the, uh, the assignment was to help, well, by drafting of a speech for your consideration uh, about the specialist system. And I had no idea really what the specialist system was and um, or uh, any idea really of the history of the specialist system on the New York Stock Exchange. So, you know, my first impression was why are you asking me? Uh, not only did I just get here, but uh, isn't this something that maybe economists at the SEC would be in a better position to write about or talk about with you? And the answer, of course, as people might remember from those days, you know, uh, economists at the SEC were as rare as hen's teeth. I, I think maybe for every 50 or 100 lawyers at the SEC, maybe you could find one economist. Um, so uh, there I was. And um, where would I turn? Uh, as a as a new lawyer, well, naturally, I would turn to the law, and in particular, I would turn to the Securities Acts of uh, Acts Amendments of 1975 to see what they had to say, um, to uh, give a then current grounding to questions about the role of specialists in the brave new world of a national market system. And as I turned to the 75 amendments, I, I discovered that the, S, the SEC was given an enormous range of responsibility and directed to use that responsibility in ingenious ways uh, to facilitate a national market system. And in doing so, uh, to realize a number of goals that uh, in certain important respects seemed in tension with one another as Annette had alluded to. And these are found in section 11 capital A, not to be confused with 11 small a of the Securities Exchange Act. 
And um, that's a provision that we in, in market regulation at the time really committed to memory. Uh, not willingly, but it was unavoidable that we would um, be able to call these provisions up out of our memory. Uh, so what were those what were those goals? And Annette alluded to a couple of these or more in her her remarks. One was the economically efficient execution of trades. Okay, that sounds like a fairly straightforward technology centered goal. Uh, another goal that the SEC was to have very much in mind was uh, promoting the availability to brokers, dealers, and investors of information respecting quotes and uh, last sale transactions in security, something that we very much take into account. Uh, I see Stephen holding up three minutes. Is that three minutes or three seconds, Steve? <laughs> three minutes, okay. Uh, okay, I'll skip the other goals, but one that was my favorite was fair competition among brokers and dealers, exchange markets, and competition between exchange markets and markets other than exchange markets. Um, well, what did I do um, with that? Well, to be honest, I don't remember, or I didn't remember when I got a call um, a couple of weeks ago or more to uh, participate in this conference. So I had to track down Roberta's speech and I would like to uh, have a shout out to the SEC Historical Society. Thank you, Annette, because I was able to track down Roberta's pre-internet speech um, through the SEC Historical um, Society. So uh, briefly, what, what do I take away these many, many years uh, uh, from that speech? One is, that Roberta, as many others have commented, showed intellectual courage in how she approached these issues. Um, it was at a time when momentum had been gaining uh, within the SEC, particularly, particularly among the senior staff of the SEC, for eliminating uh, the separate exchanges and creating a black box or a club into which all orders would be entered. And I, I, I learned fairly quickly as a new lawyer at the SEC that this really was the ambition or the, or the wish at least of many among the senior staffers at the SEC. And one key point that I have always kept in mind was Roberta's very lawyerly and careful approach to issues of market structure and the role of specialists. And the central theme, I think, of her speech was that there are always trade-offs. And in our zeal for change, we shouldn't ignore or pretend that trade-offs don't exist. It was not popular at the time uh, to say that the specialist system with its conflicts of interest might actually have some countervailing benefits for the markets. And it was important to understand that there is a difference between the existence of a conflict of interest and acting out those conflicts of interest. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of my personal um, points about learning from this experience, other than to simply say that Roberta taught me uh, how to respect others with whom I work because she was very she showed me a great deal of respect, perhaps more than I deserved, by actually keeping intact a fair amount of what I had drafted. And um, the other thing that I would just like to um, leave with you with is how prescient Roberta is on so many things. And to demonstrate her prescience on market structure, I want to lift something from that 1978 speech, and this was not nothing that I had drafted. This is entirely her words. So bear with me, uh, Stephen, just for 90 more seconds. Here's what Roberta said in 1978. See if these words have resonance in 2021. I think they do. Roberta said, whatever the national market system is as a concept or ideal and whatever it becomes as a reality, 
The national market system must enjoy the trust and confidence of the securities industry, the government, and most importantly, the public. Although our market me mechanisms must be modernized and we must use technology to solve uh, challenges of institutional domination of the trading markets, we must not lose faith in the people who operate and use our market mechanisms. The extent to which we trust these people depends on our evaluation of their ability, judgment, and integrity. That evaluation is a moral as well as a business assessment and includes an ethical judgment of how well a market participant resolve conflicts between self interest and obligations to the marketplace. These words could have been written today uh, but they were written 44 years ago. Thank you, Roberta, for uh, that happy, happy, informative experience of mine. And please don't lie and tell me you remember any of this. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think we just had further proof. Uh, you know, it's like you can't eat just one potato chip. Uh, trying to short, uh, speak briefly about how amazing Roberta and her impact on this field has been is just not possible. Uh, Eric was sure he was going to be short, but you just you can't do it. There's so many wonderful things to say. Uh, I think Roberta wants to weigh in for a second. Oh, you're you're muted still. Well, I, I think we want to finish with everybody else before I say things, uh, although Eric has challenged me. So I just want to say quickly. Eric, it's hard for me to remember that you were the attorney working on this, but I do remember the speech because it was somewhat controversial at the time. Um, yes. And it, to me, it was a very important set of ideas that I had about how the national market system was not only supposed to be about efficiency, but also about fairness. And I think that is something that is still important today. I'll say more when this whole pro with this whole part of the program is over. That's great. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, so now we're turning to Hardy, who is going to talk about the uh, discussion of the current market data focus uh, and its ties to Roberta's, um, Roberta's work. Uh, thank you, Hardy. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, Annette and Eric have done a, a, a great job of explaining how Roberta was really present at the creation of the nar national market system rules back in the, uh, the late 70s. And uh, I, I too went back to section 11 cap A <laughs> uh, to look at the extremely general and somewhat contradictory goals that Congress set forth and gave the SEC uh, a great deal of discretion in, in, in setting up a national market system. And I think most everyone would agree that that uh, uh, system actually worked pretty well for the, for the next 20 years. Uh, and then in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, the uh, exchanges, for some understandable reasons, uh, decided to demutualize and go from not-for-profit, uh, member-owned, uh, member member-controlled uh, organizations to for-profit uh, uh, shareholder-owned organizations, and uh, Roberta was really the first person to raise her hand and say in the, the, the Seats to Shares article that, hey, this changes things. We need to, uh, we need to rethink how this is all, uh, all going to work. And uh, 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 actually, shortly thereafter, Annette wrote <laughs> at the commission a, a concept release uh, about uh, self-regulation and how, uh, how demutualization uh, would affect, uh, affect self-regulation. Uh, self um, anyway, uh, what I want to argue is for the very current continued relevance of Roberta's work today <laughs> uh, in thinking through, uh, thinking through these issues. As, as, as Roberta set forth in that article, uh, at the time, there were sort of four main sources of revenue that exchanges had, um, listing fees from public companies, uh, membership fees from broker-dealers, uh, transaction fees from executions of uh, securities trades, and market data fees, the, the, the fees that uh, exchanges get for selling uh, information. Well, in the 20 years since, since then, 
you know, listing fees, the exchanges compete for listings of public companies. That's not an area where they can charge very much. Broker dealers don't really have to be members of the exchanges uh, any longer. Uh, you know, as long as there are a few market makers that can uh, route to the exchanges, uh, uh, your ordinary broker dealer is no longer a member of most uh, most major exchanges. Most transactions, uh, as we heard earlier today, are actually executed at, at market makers and alternative trading systems, not on the floor of the exchanges. Those are not uh, 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 as significant revenues. But market data, that's where the money is. Uh, so all broker dealers are required to send their quote and trade data immediately and for free to the exchanges. The exchanges then aggregate that information, and the broker dealers are required to buy it back from them uh, and provide it uh, provide it to customers. Uh, and uh, when I was general counsel at uh, at Charles Schwab in uh, uh, late '90s, early 2000s, we realized that we were paying. Uh, tens of millions of dollars for information, and we didn't even think it was very good quality information uh, uh, because the really good quality information uh, was just too expensive uh, to uh, 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 to be able to pass on to uh, to the customers. And institutional investors uh, uh, get that information through their Bloomberg terminals. They actually don't pay for it themselves. They use their clients' uh, soft dollar money to uh, to pay for that. So there's actually uh, uh, is and has been a significant difference between the quality of the market data that retail investors get versus institutional uh, uh, investors. Um, anyway, in the late 2000s, of course, there was the uh, financial crisis and uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, and that uh, uh, slowed down the SEC in addressing some of these the, the conflicts of issue conflicts of interest issues between uh, 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 exchanges and, uh, uh, and, 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 and customers and broker-dealers uh, that, uh, that demutualization had, uh, had created. But uh, just in the last year, uh, the SEC passed two very significant, uh, in my view, uh, reform uh, efforts, which, both of which are in the D.C. Circuit right now. Uh, the first was what, uh, what people call the... Uh, 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 national market system plan governance uh, uh, amendments, and, and what the SEC said is that the national market system plans, so right now there's, to simplify a little bit, three national market system plans, two of which are essentially controlled by uh, the New York Stock Exchange, one of which is controlled by, uh, by NASDAQ, uh, and uh, uh, the SEC ordered that uh, there be uh, an addition of public governors to uh, to those to, to those plans. Uh, we've had pub public governors at the exchanges themselves and at uh, 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 other SROs for uh, uh, 45 years now, but we've never had them on uh, on, on the national market system plans themselves. Uh, there's uh, the SEC adopted a limit on. Uh, Many of the uh, exchanges now are, are groups of multiple exchanges, and each different exchange gets their own separate vote. Uh, and uh, the SEC put a limit on that uh, and required, uh, I think perhaps most importantly, uh, the SEC require, is, gonna, is requiring an independent plan uh, administrator to uh, actually do the administration of these national market system plans. Uh, that rule was uh, adopted in May last year. Uh, and interestingly, you know, we have one of the most bitterly divided partisan uh, commissions that I have seen in my career right now. But all of the commissioners on both sides of the uh, of the aisle supported these uh, these amendments. Uh, the exchanges, however, are uh, 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 fighting their loss of power uh, as, uh, as as bitterly as they can. And uh, uh, and, and this case was actually argued in the D.C. Circuit. At, uh, at, at the end of April, with the exchanges arguing that uh, this was arbitrary and capricious and inconsistent with Section 11 Cap A. Uh, and uh, uh, even more recently, in, uh, in, in December of last year, uh, the SEC adopted uh, what, uh, what we call the market data infrastructure uh, uh, rule amendments which would create, uh, for the first time, what, uh, what people call competing consolidators. So instead of all the information for uh, uh, 
uh, stocks that are have their primary listing on the NYSE going to one uh, exclusive securities information processor, uh, there would be uh, that same information would go to uh, multiple consolidators who would be able to uh, uh, get it at the same time and compete, uh, selling it out to uh, 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 broker dealers and uh, and and investors. And uh, the exchanges hated this so much that they sued in the D.C. Circuit before the SEC had even gotten around to uh, uh, publishing the rule proposal in the Federal Register. Uh, and so that is also pending, uh, pending at, uh, at the D.C. Circuit. Uh, but again, the basic conflicts of interest that happen, you know, I think when, uh, uh, when the exchanges had been member-owned uh, uh, not-for-profits, there was at least some uh, 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 you know, constraint on their ability to raise the prices to uh, 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 broker dealers and through the broker dealers to uh, to investors on uh, on this market data. Uh, some of that constraint went away uh, uh, when the exchanges went to for profit status. As I say, Roberta was the first person who stood up and said, "Hey, this is a problem. <laughs> we need to do something about uh, uh, about this problem." And uh, uh, and and uh, it is, you know, very much a, uh, a a an issue that the SEC is still grappling with today. That is in the courts today, uh, and uh, uh, I am hopeful that after uh, you know more than twenty years myself of advocating for uh, 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 reforms in this area, uh, that you know we hope will ultimately make. Better quality data uh, available to more uh, to more people at a at a lower cost. That uh, that that might actually happen, uh, but uh, I, I don't know if if any of this happens if it weren't for Roberta uh, uh, sort of flagging the issue and uh, uh, and and raising it on the agenda for uh, for people at the commission and uh, and and in the industry. So. Uh, uh, I really will <laughs> stop a few minutes uh, uh, early so that we do end up having some uh, some time for uh, for discussion. And uh, uh, Steve, I'll uh, I'll pass it back to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Hardy. Uh, and just really, you know, again, incredible to hear uh, the impact that Roberta's had. And I see Roberta's hand up uh, again, um, and uh, this time I think she means it. Okay. Uh, this has been a very interesting um, set of presentations, and yet it has been a trip down memory lane for those of us who are interested in SEC market structure regulation. Um, I would tie together some of these presentations, including Jim Fantos, uh, with a concern that I had when I was writing uh, for a number of years about the demutualization of stock exchanges and stock exchanges going from um, mutual organizations to for-profit organizations and losing their role as important regulators of the securities markets. Um, at the time, the World Bank was pressuring stock exchanges all over the world to demutualize on the theory that this was somehow going to reform the securities markets everywhere. He's got two devices. Pardon? Uh, we got some interference, but go for it. Don't mind us. So at, at the time, uh, I was doing a lot of speaking and writing, and I was even hired by a few of the World Bank subsidiaries to think about this and write about this. Um, the Asian American Bank, the Latin American Bank. And my husband said to me, you're, you're doing all these writing and speaking on demutualization. I can't tell if you're for it or against it. And people have remarked that I did not come out with some kind of an overarching theory. Um, and my, my answer to my husband was, well, I'm actually against it, but it's going to happen. So all we can do is figure out a way to deal with this from a legal and regulatory perspective, because I think that 
the conflicts between the exchanges becoming public companies and becoming and staying as regulators was too serious. They lost their self-regulatory um, apparatus um, because they could not be both public companies catering to shareholders and mutual companies dealing with the industry. Um, I think with regard to the national market system uh, program starting in 1977, when I first got involved with it and coming to the present day, one of the big problems is that the government and the industry um, and the business community has always cared about efficiency and cost much more than about the fairness of the markets. And I think we've seen some of these problems recently in the markets, which have become pretty much unregulated uh, in general. We haven't just lost self-regulation, we've lost regulation of the markets by anybody, by the SEC or anyone else. Um, I also have long felt that a problem in the markets was improper leverage. And I think we've seen, as Annette talked about, we've seen the problems with improper leverage today. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the 1987 market crash when I was on the board of the New York Stock Exchange. And then this market leverage was called portfolio insurance. Well, it's, it doesn't matter what kind of a label is given to all this leverage. It's all the same. It's um, leverage that goes too far and eventually ends up with problems. So yes, it's very hard to have over, overarching theories about all of these problems. And the SEC and the Congress have never really been able to appropriately regulate the securities markets since 1975. And that's why I have written so much about all of these problems. And I thank the people on this panel from calling attention to that. I agree with Jim Fanto. It, to the extent there is any self-regulation left today, it's really with the compliance function inside the firms. But I'm, I'm not sure that that is going to be sufficiently effective. Um, there's always too many conflicts of interest um, in the securities markets um, and I say, I think an insufficient emphasis on the fairness of the markets and not just their cost and efficiency. So I would, uh, I think first like to um, invite the other members of the panel um, to see if they would like to respond in any way to anything that uh, other panelists have said, or the Roberta just said, uh, I think that would be a great place to start. All right, Eric, you're up. And then Jim. <laughs> so uh, a question and then an observation. The, the question is, I wonder, Roberta, or anyone on the panel, how you would evaluate uh, what FINRA has done as a self-regulator. I mean, the theory, I think, was, well, let's get the self-regulatory apparatus out from under. Um, the trade organization, if you will, and make it a freestanding self-regulator, and that would free it up to be a more effective self-regulator than if it was a captive of a trade association. Um, um, the, the other point is a, an observation, and that is there's never been a self-regulatory organization for investment advisors, and uh, in particular for mutual fund management firms. And I would, um, I would posit um, this point that uh, perhaps when we look at the history of compliance with the law, that maybe the mutual fund management firm industry has done a, a somewhat better job than the broker dealer industry. And maybe that's in part attributable to the clear understanding and acceptance that those who manage mutual funds are clearly fiduciaries, whereas in the broker-dealer field, uh, there's been some murkiness when you create a self-regulator that adopts a know-your-customer rule, 
which by itself does not say this is a fiduciary standard, but it's an industry self-regulatory standard, sort of occupies the field and creates this negative pregnant that because you have a know your customer rule, therefore you're probably not a, a fiduciary in the strict sense. So with that question about FINRA's effectiveness as a standalone self-regulator in that observation, I would turn it back to Roberta and the others. I think Jim had uh, something he wanted to weigh in with. I, I, I had a, another question. Why don't, why don't people respond to Eric? Well, Al, I, I deal with FINRA on behalf of clients uh, all the time. And uh, once again, I think uh, 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 Roberta's observation uh, in, uh, in one of the articles that Jim highlighted is the right observation. You know, that there are old court cases going back to the 60s saying, oh, self-regulatory organizations really are private uh, and, and are not part of the government. And that's changed. Every broker dealer now, as a matter of statute, has to be a member. Uh, every dealer, broker dealer, at least that has public uh, customers, has to be a member of uh, FINRA. Uh, and yet FINRA takes the position that it's not a state actor. It doesn't have the same level of uh, transparency that a government agency does. It's not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. You know, its, uh, it's budget is much less uh, uh, transparent. Uh, you know, my, my personal view is that FINRA does uh, a pretty good job most of the time uh, uh, on, on sort of day-to-day -day, uh, management, but I think it is long past time, and this is something that Roberta uh, wrote, you know, 15 years ago, uh, to recognize that, okay, FINRA really is a quasi-government uh, uh, organization now, and it should be uh, treated in uh, uh, in that way. And I think if the issue were ever to go to the Supreme Court under the current Supreme Court precedents about, you know, what is, uh, what is a government agency, that's what the Supreme Court would say. Uh, and, and we'd all be better off if we just accepted that, uh, uh, that that's what FINRA is. All right, everybody, I just say we will have, we have a little over five minutes left for our panel. Uh, and, um, so if you have any thoughts, you feel free to put them in the Q&A um, uh, or uh, to send them to me otherwise via the chat, maybe. Uh, Jim now has uh, his hand up again. I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, I agree with Hardy uh, about FINRA, uh, but I think uh, Roberta was prescient about it years ago. I mean, I guess what I'd ask the other panelists, I mean, uh, points that, that you've all made, and, and I think this agrees with what Roberta said long ago. Uh, you know, she was pragmatic about the markets and about market structure. And uh, as Annette said, you know, there are no easy answers uh, to market structure questions. And you know, it's a highly technical area. It's it's something I know the Congress, it's not no surprise that they punted it to the SEC because they didn't really want to want to lay everything out. Uh, no, no easy answers on market questions. And then as Hardy pointed out, oh, the ones that really matter today are data ones. And, and so you see the SEC reacting at times, and maybe now it's, it, it's looking again at payment for order flow and say, well, should we do more on that? Uh, what I say is maybe Annette wants to talk or any, anyone or Roberta, but I think Roberta said this long ago. It's like, you, you want to encourage competition, but, but you want to protect the investors and give them best prices. So what can the SEC do other than, you know, unless Congress tells it something else to react to the problems that are before it in a very kind of pragmatic way? And I mean, is there, is there much more for it to do, you know, without a whole statutory revision or, or market revision? Well, I, I guess I would say, look, I think um, we're going to see a very 
Muscular Activist Commission under Chairman Gensler. Um, I think he um, will feel that he's got all the authority he needs under the legislation to act in in you know whatever manner uh, the commission sees fit. And so I, I think we're going to see a lot of revisiting of issues, including the ones that I mentioned. I think you're gonna see a lot of focus, whether it's on things that Eric mentioned on, you know, basically BI issues on uh, you know, fiduciary duty and the duties of brokers. You're going to see a focus on, you know, investor fairness issues that Robert has been concerned about. I think there is going to be a lot of, uh, you know, you, we're hearing Gary say, well, maybe disclosure isn't enough in some cases, which is obviously a very uh, progressive view. Um, I do think we're going to see. Uh, another focus on payment for order flow and internalization, which is extremely challenging, uh, right? Because um, there, I mean, the SEC has looked at this several times and while they seem to be quite unpopular topic, the commission has repeatedly come to the conclusion that the practices in general, obviously there were exceptions, but the practices in general benefited retail customers by providing uh, more efficient pricing for them and that it was possible to have payment for order flow that was done consistent with best execution. Now they're going to look at it again. So we'll see, we'll see again what the data shows. As Eric says, we, they keep hiring more and more economists. So maybe they'll have more and more uh, data and theories to, uh, to analyze this under. But um, I think we're going to be revisiting a lot of the issues that we've seen before, but with a much more, uh, as I said, uh, aggressive pro-investor focus than perhaps we have over the last um, two years. So, Robert, I'd be um, interested in whether you back. agree with that. Let me um, come back just briefly to a comment that uh, that Eric made um, about investment advisors and uh, and broker dealers, because I think this is going to be an important issue too. Every year for the last 15 years, uh, the number of broker-dealers registered with FINRA has gone down. During that same time period, every year the number of investment advisors registered with the SEC has gone up. Uh, FINRA gets into even the smallest broker-dealers to examine them every three or four years. Investment advisors, especially retail investment advisors, you know, it is maybe every nine or 10 years that the SEC gets to them. On average, the SEC gets to about 10% of investment advisors, SEC registered investment advisors in a year. So I think there actually is an imbalance there. Uh, and, you know, my view has always been, you know, rules are important, but, you know, having cops on the beat <laughs> is also really important. And there aren't very many cops on the beat for investment advisors. And you're seeing a big migration from the broker dealer industry to the investment advisor industry for a lot of reasons, you know, and, you know, investment advisors get a, a stable annual fee from their customers, and that's very uh, attractive as a, as a business model. Um, but uh, I, I do think the, there is an imbalance between broker dealer and investment advisor uh, regulation that the SEC needs to uh, uh, address. And I, I personally think the issue is not so much the standard of care as it is the number of cops on the beat, and uh, and that's a big issue for uh, for the SEC to have to deal with. So we've got uh, let me yeah, let me say was, uh, that yeah. another historical point is when I was an SEC commissioner, at the request of Harold Williams, the chairman, I was asked to give a speech advocating a self-regulatory organization for investment advisors. I gave that speech, I think, at the mutual funds conference. And of course, as you all know, nothing came of it then or since then. But I think it is still something that is lacking in terms of self-regulation. Um, so we are now uh, about at our time. Uh, and I wanted to offer either Jim or Roberta an opportunity to say uh, any final thoughts on this topic. This is not the end of the conference, but on this panel, uh, if either Jim or Roberta had anything they wanted to sum up with here. I would just say 
uh, going back again in, to 1975 or 1977 when I was a commissioner, I can remember Andy Klein, who was then head of the Division of Market Regulation, and Eric probably remembers him, saying, I, I don't know what we're going to do about this industry. I mean, it seems to be a business model based on price fixing and carving up markets. And I don't know how the government can really deal with that. And when you look at all the controversies about payment for order flow and other issues, he was right then. And probably these issues are still with us today. So, Robert, I don't want to make you nervous, but this is being recorded. I'm kidding. You know. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, uh, so just for the panelists, I want to encourage you to now turn your mics and video off for the lunch break. And for everybody else, if you need me to tell you it's lunchtime, you're doing it wrong. Um, thank you so much for being with us uh, and look forward to seeing you again at 2 p.m. Okay, um, welcome back everyone. I think our, our panel begins now. Um, my name is Andrew Gold and I'm a professor here at Brooklyn Law School. And I'll be moderating a great panel on uh, financial services and financial intermediaries. Uh, before I begin though, I just wanna say uh, it's been an incredible honor and a privilege uh, to serve on the same faculty as Roberta. It's been, it's been wonderful and I'm very glad to be here. And it's an honor to uh, participate in this program uh, celebrating her work. Um, I'll begin just with a, a quick introduction to our of our panelists and uh, describe how we'll proceed and then we can go from there. Um, okay, first off, we have we have two speakers. Um, first, uh, Arthur Laby, who is professor of law and co-director of the Rutgers Center for Corporate Law and Governance at Rutgers Law School. Um, and the title of his presentation will be Investment Management Regulation, followed by Alan Palmiter, the William T. Wilson III Presidential Chair for Business Law and Professor of Law at Wake Forest Law School. And his presentation will be on the enduring fiduciary in retail investing. Uh, we have two commenters, uh, Andrew Buddy Donahue, Adjunct Professor of Law here at Brooklyn and former director of the SEC Division of Investment Management, and Solly Omarova, Beth and Mark Goldberg Professor of Law and director, Clark Program on the Law and Regulation of Financial Institutions and Markets at Cornell Law School. Um, the way that we'll uh, begin our program is uh, about 30 minutes uh, for um, Arthur and then Alan to give their presentations after which um, Buddy and Solly will provide general observations and comments on the issues that those presentations raise. Uh, after which Arthur and Alan will have a brief opportunity uh, to give some further thoughts uh, in response. And then we'll open things up to Q&A. Uh, during the Q&A period, as, as before, we would encourage uh, attendees uh, to use the, the Q&A section to pose questions, which I can then uh, ask the participants. Uh, or if you're a panelist in the program, you can also raise your hand. Uh, without further ado, uh, Arthur, why don't we turn to you? Terrific. Um, thanks very much, Andrew. Well, uh, hi, everybody, and hello, Roberta. Um, um, I first want to thank uh, Jim Fanto and Ted Jenger and others for including me in this celebration of Roberta. It's really, it's really an honor to, to, to be part of this. Um, I have a lot to say about, about Roberta, uh, but I only have 15 minutes. And I know that Andrew can be a brutal timekeeper when he wants to be, so I have to be strategic. Um, we've heard a lot over the past uh, two days about Roberta's contributions to the SEC, in private practice, and in academia. But there's even more to say. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Instead of presenting my own paper this afternoon, which I actually still hope to write, um, I want to start by talking about some of Roberta's service outside of the SEC and the law school and highlight some of the contributions that she has made in areas that I don't think anybody has mentioned 
I will then turn uh, briefly to Roberta's scholarship in the investment management area um, and highlight uh, why I think it's been so interesting and so helpful. So um, the first thing I wanted to mention is that Roberta has been extremely active in the SEC Historical Society, mentioned by Annette and Eric earlier today. Um, as many of you know, the SEC Historical Society is an online museum and archive of the history of financial regulation. It's not affiliated with the SEC, but many former commissioners and staff are active volunteer contributors. And in fact, Annette is our, is our current president. Roberta is a member of the Board of Trustees, but she has also served on the museum committee and on three of the gallery building task forces in her areas of expertise, market structure, enforcement, and investment management. As we build these galleries, Roberta always provides thoughtful and helpful comments on any document she's asked to review. And I can testify that her contributions during board calls and meetings are succinctly and diplomatically offered. In fact, they are often very much about people or subjects who we should not forget. And she is always careful to remind us to check her memory, but invariably, she, she always turns out to be correct, even though she, she, she occasionally doubts herself. Roberta also seems to ask the question that is on everyone's mind in a sort of disarming way, leading to a sense of relief that allows the assembled group to tackle the issue and move forward. She has donated reams of her correspondence, briefing papers, reports, and other materials from her SEC years to the society. It's really a treasure trove of unique items that has helped to grow the, the, the virtual museum in many ways. Not only has she been a generous donor every year, but she has never missed a meeting except one, I am told, in her nearly five years of board service due to an unavoidable conflict. And even then she gave lots of advance notice. Our executive director had the following to say about Roberta. She's been the quintessential board member. I admire her for her service and commitment to the mission, but I also appreciate her for her kindness and support to me personally. She's just a wonderful human being. I agree with every word of that. I think we all do. Roberta has really helped the organization to flourish in so many ways. Here is another example. As you may have seen in her biography for this conference, Roberta was recently appointed to serve on the board of the direct board of directors of the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, the CFP board, which administers the CFP exam, upholds the mark, and disciplines CFP professionals. I was in touch with the leadership at the CFP board, who told me that in 2019, the board undertook a special search to find a public board member, somebody who's not a CFP, with regulatory and enforcement experience. The search firm landed on Roberta, and it's an understatement to say that the nominating committee was impressed. They quickly learned that Roberta is a person of few well-chosen words. How true is that? After an afternoon of talkative candidates, Roberta stood in stark contrast. When she was asked, are you prepared to make CFP board work a priority given your other obligations? Roberta's reply was simply, yes. The rest of the interview was similar. In fact, when the committee began to deliberate, one member noted that she answered all of their questions in 22 minutes while other candidates were still chatting away after 45 minutes into the interview. When the committee considered the depth and substance of her answers, her selection was a shoe in According to the organization's leadership, Roberta brings an important public member perspective to the boardroom. She's strategic, targeted, fair, and sensible. Their words, not mine and she does it with an economy of words. 
We are so fortunate, they said to me, that she shares her wisdom and experience with the CFP board and the financial planning profession. I think we would all agree that they are lucky to have her. Finally, I just wanna point out for anybody here who does not know that in 2017, Roberta received the William O. Douglas Award presented by the Association of SEC Alumni. This award is presented to one, just one SEC alum each year who has made a significant contribution to the development of the federal securities laws and served the financial community and the SEC community with distinction and whose achievements are considered extraordinary by her peers. I know that a lot of people at this conference are familiar with the ASICA Award. In fact, I think the only other attendee to actually receive the award is Ed Green, who was with us yesterday. Um, he received the award in, in 2005. In any case, if this conference has whetted your appetite for more Roberta, I recommend that you read Roberta's remarks from the 2017 ASICA dinner, which are another window into Roberta's professional life and very funny, although she claimed that she is not very good at telling jokes. Okay, I'll spend the rest of my time talking briefly about Roberta's scholarship in the investment, in the investment management area, since that, I believe, is what I was asked to do, um, based on three articles spaced 10 years apart. It seems that in addition to her other outpouring of scholarship, every 10 years or so, Roberta drops another article in the investment management area just to stay in the game. In 1995, Roberta published Is the Shingle Theory Dead, whose title just makes you want to read the article in the Washington and Lee Law Review. In 2005, she published Mutual Funds, Pension Funds, Hedge Funds, and Stock Market Volatility, what regulation by the SEC is appropriate in the Notre Dame Law Review. And then in 2016, she published The Challenge of Fiduciary Regulation, the Investment Advisors Act after 75 years in the Brooklyn Journal of Corporate Financial and Commercial Law. So let's start with, is the shingle theory dead? The article discusses the application of the shingle theory, which Roberta explains is really meant for unsophisticated investors as markets become more institutionalized. But the article does not merely discuss the shingle theory. It assesses the relationship between the shingle theory and a broker's fiduciary duty long before the national obsession over whether to place a fiduciary duty on brokers that give advice. The article also addresses the relationship between the shingle theory and private rights of action and between the shingle theory and whether SRO rule violations are a basis for a 10b5 claim. Whenever someone wants a primer on the shingle theory, including what happened to it and why, this I think is the go-to article. And in Roberta's style, she does it in fewer than 30 pages. 10 years later, Roberta wrote mutual funds, pension funds, hedge funds, and stock market volatility. What regulation by the SEC is appropriate? In this article, Roberta notes that the role of institutional investors in market volatility, such as the bubble of the 1990s, was not carefully scrutinized by the SEC because the commission was more focused on investor protection than on the regulation of institutional investors. She explains that while the SEC regulates mutual funds, pension funds are regulated by the DOL, bank collective funds by the OCC, commodity pools by the CFTC, and so on. The article claims that regulation, therefore, is neither consistent nor coherent. This is one area where, as Roberta may recall, I tend to disagree slightly because as she says, regulation safeguards the beneficiaries of these institutional investors through safety and soundness and fiduciary principles. So while regulation may be inconsistent, it seems to me that it's still coherent with a focus on fiduciary duties. In any case, the article questions whether these institutional investors should be subject 
to different regulators and whether securities regulation should not focus more on controlling speculation and excessive credit. Of course, we know now that the article was far-sighted because the financial crisis of 2008-2009, just a few years after this article was published, was due at least to some extent to speculation and excessive credit. Roberta effectively predicted in this article that a new crisis would focus the attention of Congress, the SEC, and other regulators on risk and reforming the behavior of institutional investors. Fast forward 10 years and Roberta published The Challenge of Fiduciary Regulation, the Investment Advisors Act after 75 years a sort of retrospective on the statute. The article takes up key issues surrounding the Advisors Act at its 75th birthday in 2015. After summarizing the history of the act's passage and some of the important amendments, the article gives a kind of report card on how well the statute has addressed its purposes as set forth in 1940. Although Roberta does not give out grades to the statute, it's fair to say that the assessment was middling. I think if my son brought home a report card like this, it would be no Minecraft for you know, a month or two. The article then takes a look at attempts by the SEC and the DOL to place a fiduciary duty on brokers that give advice and makes the case for a principles-based approach. The article recounts developments in this area up to 2005 when the article was published and all but predicted that the DOL's fiduciary rule would be vacated by the courts. The article then wades into the debate over whether advisors should be regulated by an SRO as Eric and Hardy and Roberta all mentioned in the last panel. And the article comes down in favor of an SRO approach, although Roberta recognizes that the issue is fraught. Her reasoning with respect to advisors is that at bottom, issues like suitability and skill and investment analysis are just as important as fees, but neither the SEC nor the DOL has the competence to determine what advice is really in a client's best interest. So she concludes, this is better accomplished through an SRO. This issue seems to come back every 10 years or so, and it's certainly possible that we will eventually see an SRO for advisors because Roberta usually is right on issues like this one. The article also reviews developments in the examination and enforcement area, and bringing us full circle to where we started yesterday afternoon, Roberta warns that the SEC's policies with respect to advisors, and especially in the conflicts area, will be developed through enforcement cases. Again, how true it is. Although she seems less concerned about this in 2016 than she was in 1982, perhaps for some of the reasons that she alluded to yesterday afternoon. I know that I'm almost out of time. These articles are really excellent and I learn a lot whenever I, whenever I read them. I completely agree with something that Eric Pan said that Roberta's articles take the time to explain what is happening in the market today. They give enough history to bring the reader up to date, and then they explain market developments in the context of the law, and they take a stand that usually turns out to be correct with the benefit of hindsight. With that, Andrew, I'll turn it back to you and look forward to comments by the others. Uh, thank you, that was perfect timing, actually. Um, Alan, let me turn to you now. Roberta, thank you for uh, having me here. I've been privileged so many times to uh, have, uh, I've been invited to different events that uh, you were part of and thanks. Uh, uh, so we all seem to have begun thinking about when we first met Roberta and uh, somebody commented 
uh, Roberta, maybe you don't remember that, but, uh, but I do. Uh, it was for me at an ALI meeting uh, to consider the uh, principles of, of corporate governance. It was 1986, both of us were entering the Law Academy and I ended up sitting at a lunch table between uh, Roberta and Frank Easterbrook. And what poetic justice that is to have begun a career sitting between Roberta. I, I knew Roberta uh, by reputation. I uh, also recognized Frank Easterbrook by reputation. And I was taken by how um, gracious Roberta was in talking to Frank, even though I suspected she didn't uh, believe in, he, he proceeded from theory. You know, markets are right. And Roberta uh, proceeded from um, practical observation, uh, very much in the ancient Aristotelian Greek tradition. And, 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 but uh, my career, I hope, has been more tending toward Roberta's uh, uh, attempt to ask questions and to uh, not take things as given. Um, so um, I, I was going to show you a recollection curve. It turns out that psychologists study how well we recollect items on a list, and we recommend the first. We re remember the first items quite well, and then our recollection begins to decline, decline, and toward the end is uh, quite low. So here we are. We are the fifth panel, Andrew and. Uh, um, it is you know, likely that uh, uh, we will be the least remembered, but I, I'm hoping that we can wrap up some of the things, to return to some of the themes of the last couple of days. Um, and if there's been one theme that keeps on popping up in these panels, it's uh, the idea that uh, investor protection and market integrity are all to serve the economy, but then what is the economy to serve? And I would think it's to serve humanity. And uh, we are now in the recognition that investor protection may Im Im include things that serve this larger purpose of humanity. And ESG, I think, if we were to take account, has been the most often used set of initials, lots of initials. This has been. Uh, uh, had commented, he was glad to be here among uh, securities geeks. Uh, this has been a, a conference of many initials. So my um, prompt, which I, I will hope becomes a paper, is um, the enduring fiduciary in retail investing. And it's a prompt that is ambiguous. Which fiduciary are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, uh, Roberta? Are we talking about, and I think I was suggesting that Roberta is a great fiduciary. Are we talking about the SEC as fiduciary? Are we talking about institutional investors? And I don't like the word institutional investors. They're institutional shareholders. They're holding somebody else's money. Um, um, and what I'd like to do is sort of explore this idea of what a fiduciary is and what a retail investor is using some of Roberta's articles. And uh, we all remember the great uh, um, uh, sort of commentary by Felix Frankfurter in a case involving insider trading before the Supreme Court finally, uh, many years later, figured out what insider trading meant. And I, I will paraphrase the quote. To say that the SEC is a fiduciary only begins the analysis. It gives direction to further inquiry. To whom is the SEC a fiduciary? What obligations does the agency owe as a fiduciary? In what respect has the SEC failed to discharge these obligations? And what are the consequences of its deviation from its duty? Um, so that for me frames the question of fiduciary. There are a lot of embedded issues. What is retail investing? Um, so, uh, as always, I turn to a uh, form of blockchain, uh, Wikipedia, and a retail investor, also known as an individual investor, is a non-professional investor using a brokerage firm or savings retirement account, such as a 401k. Um, that's the retail investor. Institutional investor is a professional large-scale investor 
that invest other people's money on their behalf, such as a pension fund or mutual fund. Um, step away. That means that all true investing comes from individual money and savings. And even if you think about an insurance company, we have paid premiums to an insurance company and they're investing for us. And even if you begin to say, well, many of us are not investors. No, I think, I think we are all uh, directly, indirectly investing in our securities markets and our capital markets. Even you know, the statistic is that only 40% of uh, uh, Americans have a 401k plan. But the others who don't are equally in, uh, involved, are equally exposed to our capital markets uh, for employment. You know, if the capital markets don't work, employment doesn't work. If capital markets don't work, uh, product services don't happen, uh, humanity is not served. But um, so I, I decided let's try to unpack fiduciary and retail investor. And I turned to, of course, SSRN. And here, Roberta has uh, 30 posted articles, I will report, uh, with more than 11,000 downloads. And I was to show you on the screen, close your eyes, imagining happening, I'm populating the screen with all 30 articles that have, are uh, on SSRN since 1997 through 2020. So um, this is essentially the, you know, the, 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 the the main body of, of uh, Roberta's writing, even though uh, uh, I'm confident that there are many articles that aren't represented here. Um, and um, it's so interesting because as um, Arthur just pointed out, there's an episodic nature to these articles. Uh, she, uh, Roberta jumps into looking at uh, independent directors here, and then a few years later looks at independent directors there. And, and the same thing with, uh, uh, for, for, for example, uh, um, institutional shareholders, uh, the disclosure ref reforms, exemptions, and so on. I chose three articles out of these um, 30 that seem to deal with how institutional shareholders um, should have a duty to the corporation, a really interesting concept. This from 2004. Uh, so this helps understand for me the word duty. Retail uh, comes from her look at the uh, changing definition of accredited investor by a definition that leaves out the retail investor. And the independent director um, model is broken to give me a greater sense of who the fiduciary is. So looking uh, first at this regulation by exemption, the changing definition of accredited investor, and I will remind myself, it's a, a Rutgers uh, Law Review article from 2008. I did a, I, I wanted to get a sense for whether there's something special about um, uh, Roberta's uh, very effective, even terse writing, because the way that uh, Arthur just explained it, Jim had explained it before, was, was right spot on. These are not dense, long articles. These are very approachable and they, are, they have almost all the same structure. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the history. Let me tell you about current structure. Let me tell you what the issues are. And then let me give you a compelling reason based often on history, how we should proceed. And uh, so I did a word cloud analysis for each of these three articles. You've maybe seen this where you uh, put this into a program and you get this very interesting, in my case, an egg showing which words were the most used. And for this article, there aren't any sort of special words. This is a work person's article. This is not a, somebody who's developed a special vocabulary or using fancy words. SEC, funds, private, act, um, hedge, um, company, uh, it, it's 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 what we securities geeks would all recognize, and what I'd like to do is, with your permission, read the theme topic sentence. In some cases, this came from the abstract. In other cases, I dug into different places. But bear with me; I won't have it on the screen, so we'll get to exercise our visual memory. 
Um, so this is to help me understand who the retail investor is in Roberta's mind. Um, and uh, here we have Roberta to tell us if that was on her mind and whether her mind has changed. The SEC has preserved its jurisdictional grip and ideological purity in regulating IPOs by creating huge exemptions from its regulatory scheme. This has led to anomalies in the capital markets, arguably not in the interests of the retail investors, the SEC endeavors to protect. In other words, somehow there should be more democratic availability of investment for everyone. That seems to be on Roberta's mind. Instead of reforming the registration provisions of the Securities Act, to make such registration more user-friendly and less likely to result in after-the-fact lawsuits, the SEC fashioned private placement exemptions that have created a huge market for unregistered offerings. So we have the private placement exemption, we have the 144A markets, we have the special exemptions for hedge funds, and um, all of this adds up to excluding the little guy. The, the little guy participates indirectly, I guess, but um, it is rather than a democratization, which seems to be on Roberta's mind, an institutionalization of our capital markets. Um, and is that the right way to conceive of the retail investor? That this is somebody who deserves to be heard. Um, you know, we've only, we've only had 200 years of experimental democracy. It should, is democracy in the political sphere something that we should be trying to emulate in the, in the uh, uh, you know, capital sphere? Um, so as always, um, uh, nobody's used the word yet. Roberta is a provocateur. Roberta provokes thoughts in me. She invited me to a conference. She said, here's an interesting question for you to think about. I thought I hadn't thought of that. And it was, it was great to have been basically given some, in, in, in no more than two sentences, marching instructions. So the next provocation is this article, is the independent director model broken? And that is Seattle Law Review um, publication from 2013. And again, word cloud does not identify that there's anything that you're just based on the big words used independent, SEC, directors, financial, corporate, governance, uh, corporations, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's the way that, that Roberta crafts the question. And here is the question. Um, and I read again the theme sentences. Director competency may be more important than director independence. We've been barking up the wrong tree. Director independence, saying that you're not somehow financially obligated to insiders in the business in the company, um, is the wrong tree. Competency should be the right. Further, directors should have an obligation to the long-term viability of a corporation. So others have begun saying this. It's 2013. That's not uh, so remarkable. Such an obligation would infringe upon the shareholder primacy theory. Yes especially to the extent that this model encapsulates running the company for short-term economic gains. Yes. So Roberta's positioning herself. Let's, let's have, make sure that our businesses overseen by the SEC, part of our capital markets are serving an economy that is going to, in the great UN definition, provide for current needs without jeopardizing future generations. Needs. Furthermore, an institutionalized market, retail shareholders may need to be protected against institutional investors, a theme. And that has been one of the themes of today. If you think back to Jack Coffey and Jill Fish, that's exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about this problem. Can institutional investors provide for the, those for whom they are acting? And really for, I believe, the economy and society at large. Um, and in the end, um, it's these little sort of gems of questions in Roberta's articles that lead to so much, I believe, uh, further critical thinking. 
third article. Um, this one from uh, the business lawyer, 2004, should institutional shareholders owe duties to the corporation? Really provocative question. And this question has not been asked enough. And this question is being asked, answered by soft law today. BlackRock believes yes, we owe duties to our portfolio companies and we now are expecting um, portfolio companies to be performing. The word cloud again, if you'd seen it, there's nothing uh, particularly remarkable, but the question is, the framing of this question is so remarkable. Under the federal securities laws, directors are charged with owing duties to shareholders who are considered the owners of the corporation, therefore given rights at the expense of other corporate constituents. Uh, that's where securities laws is, has migrated. In the wake of recent corporate scandals, institutions have been demanding more rights. That's true. And, you know, here, uh, it, it's this obeisance to the institutions that leads to all of these problems and that we keep on giving them even more prerogatives. This doesn't make sense, but we did that with independent directors. We said independent directors have failed. Let's give independent directors an even stronger role, but specifically more rights to nominate corporate directors. So the institutions are demanding more rights. Here's the killer question. Shouldn't large shareholders that obtain such rights also acquire duties to the corporations in which they invest and to other shareholders? And of course, uh, Roberta later goes on to answer yes. Um, how these rights are exactly carried out, as Jack Clark pointed out, the devil is in the details. Roberta doesn't go into in great depth, but she leads us to, leads me to think this is where our focus should be today. So I, I conclude, I think I have a minute if you don't mind. The enduring fiduciary for the retail investor. If we think about this, we have to be practical. We have to be nuanced. I had a screen populated with these words. We have to be insightful, prescient, relevant, well-informed, balanced, rigorous, global, iconoclastic. We have to be Roberta. And what would Roberta say about this question? I believe that we carry in our mind the idea that the retail investor is Homer Simpson. On the screen, imagine Homer Simpson. Um, well educated, he's a you know, engineer at a nuclear power plant, uh, middle class, and no doubt has a 401k. He is the person we are seeking to protect in order to provide all the other goods. But I don't think that Homer is our current retail investor who we should think of. And whenever we think, you know, who am I talking to? Who's, who am I fiduciary to? We should we conjure somebody. I believe we should be conjuring Lisa Simpson. Much smarter than Homer. Um, oh, many of those traits that we had seen about, about Roberta. In fact, somebody did a psychological profile. What are Lisa's interests? What is who's Lisa? Uh, her interests include music, science, justice animals, shapes, feelings. Um, to say ESG is to flatten the discussion. To say sustainability is not to do much more. For me, we are engaged in the greatest challenge ever, which is to be engaged in integrated thinking and to think beyond our security geek world, beyond our law world, beyond um, our world of words, our, we have to include numbers, we have to, there's so much more. We have to include music, science, justice, animals, shapes, feelings. So I end with one final quote. This is a paraphrase of uh, uh, Roberta finishing an article. The ability to challenge the conventional wisdom, to tell truth to power is rare. And even rare is the lawyer scholar who can do so but not destroy collegiality. Yet celebrating such individuals should be our object. Everybody's used the word wonderful. I use it in this way, Roberta. You fill me full of wonder.
Thank you, Alan. Um, we'll turn now to Buddy Donahue and Sally Omarova for their comments and reactions. Uh, they'll speak for about 10 to 12 minutes each, and we'll start with Buddy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, it is such an honor to have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be a part of uh, this uh, conference, uh, really celebrating all of the contributions of Roberta, but more celebrating Roberta. Um, I did not, unlike many uh, folks that have spoken today, I did not have the benefit of having uh, met uh, Roberta early in my career. Boy, I really wish I had. Uh, I really would have benefited greatly from uh, her mentoring, her uh, wisdom, uh, and, and her clarity in thinking about a whole range of things. Uh, in preparing uh, for this, I read several of her um, uh, academic papers and, and found them fascinating. And um, I, I will say, as many have, I think that there probably is not uh, anything I've read that Roberta wrote where I didn't say to myself, wow, I had never thought of it that way. Or, geez, you know, that's an interesting perspective. I, you know, um, or, wow, I didn't know that. And so I've always learned and, and uh, really appreciate uh, uh, all the knowledge and wisdom that uh, Roberta has done. I took a different approach from uh, many here in preparing. What I did was to say, well, okay, Roberta was a SEC commissioner, obviously the first woman SEC commissioner, but, um, and she was a commissioner, I think by my count for about 29 months. And I said, wow, I wonder how much speaking she did during that period of time. So I went back and I said, okay, well, you can get these or on the SEC website. Um, you have to hunt a little bit, but you can find them. And during the period that, that Roberta was a commissioner, um, there were 98 speeches that were done by commissioners, including the chairman uh, and Roberta. Um, by the way, 38 of them were by Roberta. So, uh, and 41 were by the chairman. Um, only 19 were done by the other three commissioners. Uh, so Roberta gave us more than a speech every month that she was a commissioner. There weren't just speeches. And I went back and I, I read several of them that, that I found uh, of interest. They were timely. They, uh, like her articles that, that she wrote, they raised issues. You know, early on, uh, she gave a speech about the need really for a self-regulatory organization for investment advisors. And wouldn't that benefit the industry? And gee, the SEC doesn't have enough um, capacity really to go out and to do the job that needs to be done in terms of um, uh, examining uh, the, the industry and make sure there aren't any issues there. And, you know, she made a compelling case for, geez, you know, that you're professionals and, and you really need uh, the, the ability really to, um, to, to have your profession regulated. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was struck a little bit by the fact there were 5,400 advisors and 200 billion uh, of assets. By the way, the advisors right now, um, last count, and I'm sure it's higher than that, it was almost $100 trillion uh, in uh, U.S. advisors. So, um, you know, just tremendous growth. But nevertheless, that problem is still there. Um, and that characterized many of the things that I came across that Roberta spoke about and that many during today's conference and yesterday's conference have spoken about and that Roberta takes an issue um, and addresses it before it truly is an issue or one that has. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't go away. These Many of these are just really important issues um, that we struggle with that, uh, and, and in many ways, the industries um, and uh, you know, securities industry and the regulators, you know, haven't necessarily come to uh, a resolution of it, nor do I think they ever will other than um, making things better. Um, I don't think you ever really solve many of these. Uh, and you know, I think back, you know, one of the things I did during my career, um, I, I um, was the director of the investment management division during a financial crisis, um, also during Madoff, uh, and uh, also during uh, the, the uh, uh, IABD study that was done pursuant to Dodd-Frank, or as folks that uh, grew up really as broker dealers called the BDIA study. Um, 
And boy, you know, when I was sitting in that chair, I really would have benefited from having the ability to, uh, if Roberta had been a commissioner, the ability to just go up, sit down in their office and ask her questions would have just been fabulous. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have that. I had a lot of really smart people around me and a lot of good commissioners that I could talk to. Um, but having gone back and read much of uh, uh, what Roberta put out, um, she had such a great insight into so many of the things. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time and, and you know, I, I know others that are in the industry and, and participating in this conference spent a lot of time really on the whole issue of the investment advisor and broker dealer uh, regulatory regimes and, and you know, what is the best answer on that. Um, and I think Roberta addressed that very early on uh, about uh, about that. And um, you know, I found uh, a lot of the uh, writings that she had done early on. Had I been that familiar with them, I think they really, really would have helped me. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I want to thank Roberta for the opportunity, really, to be teaching at Brooklyn Law School. I had, having left the SEC, I. Um, I think we had had lunch and I said, we're writing out something I really would like to do, which is to see whether um, I might be able to, uh, to, to help students really appreciate the investment management industry. And uh, Roberta was very, very supportive of that and uh, was uh, very, very helpful, if not instrumental um, in uh, my having an opportunity really to, to do so at Brooklyn Law. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you, um, I learn every day. I try and teach just how difficult um, folks that are professors have uh, in the courses they teach and trying to uh, figure out how best to uh, express them. Others have spoken during a conference about how Roberta had the ability to ask the questions. And uh, I found that too, you know, in reading and, and just, you know, whenever I had the opportunity to talk to Roberta, but in, in reading her thing, she asks the right questions and she does so. Um, in, in the right way. And so, you know, it, it makes you think. Um, often, as I said before, gives you a different perspective um, on, on maybe the way that you were looking at a particular issue. Uh, actually, maybe framing it so that you realize that actually you might have been looking at the wrong issue, that actually this might be, um, you know, a little bit different than what you thought um, the issue might be. And, and Boy, that is ever, ever so helpful um, to to uh, to everyone, and uh, you know I'm, I'm just uh, so so grateful for um, you know the the benefit really of uh, Roberta's teachings and and uh, her writings, uh, and uh, I really have benefited uh, um, from those, and you know I I know that uh, um, you know the um, you know, both, both Alan um, and, and Arthur have, you know, discussed some of her uh, academic writings and, and whatever. And, um, you know, I know, um, Alan, I'm a little less familiar with with your writings, but uh, Arthur, I know that, you know, you are one of the experts on fiduciary law. And, and uh, you know, I'd love to be in a, in a room with uh, you and Roberta having a debate back and forth about the elements, uh, really, of fiduciary and how how best to, uh, um, to to think about those. And, you know, I um, will, uh, uh, I think I would stop there and uh, offer uh, uh, opportunity to my, uh, to my colleagues. But thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, buddy. Uh, we will turn now to Solly Omarova. Well, um, first of all, let me start by saying how happy and honored I am to be invited to this wonderful celebration for Roberta. I was one of those very fortunate um, scholars when in the very beginning of my career, Roberta was one of the very first, very senior people uh, who approached me at, at, after some presentation at the ALS conference, maybe the first time I've actually presented at such a big event, she approached me and she invited me to come to Brooklyn to a conference to present a paper about potential for self-regulation in the financial sector. And that's how I met Roberta. I was just floored by the generosity and by that sort of genuine curiosity 
of this incredibly well-established scholar, you know, with such credentials in, in, you know, something that somebody who's writing something about banking law had to say. And so I am incredibly grateful to you, Roberta, for everything throughout the years. You've been uh, one of the uh, premier examples for me personally of the kind of a scholar that uh, I aspire to be. I might not quite be there, maybe I will never be there, but this is, this is what I want to be. In, in some sense, um, what Alan said about Lisa Simpson uh, kind of, um, you know, made me think about sort of you throughout your career being the first, you know, SEC commissioner, the many firsts for uh, women in the profession at the time throughout the decades. I now would like to think of you maybe as the Lisa Simpson amongst homers, right? And this is sort of, this is a, a big role and you played that beautifully and I hope we can only live up to that. So um, I completely agree with Arthur and Alan in their expressions of admiration and body, of course, of admiration for your work. Um, to me, uh, you are one of those rare examples where, you know, you truly are a genuine scholar thinker. Because when I read your papers, or, uh, I really feel that I'm hearing you think out loud. And that to me is one of the greatest um, signs of really effective scholarship. In other words, you know, I don't wanna read yet another fancy reiteration of some, you know, trivial uh, truth out there. I want to hear what people is what people are thinking, and that's what I've learned from you. And I think that one reason for uh, why Roberta's scholarship is so uniformly appreciated for being insightful and being ahead of its time, and the word provocateur was used a few times in the most admiring of the senses, is that uh, Roberta's scholarship always goes beyond. Preoccup the preoccupation that is traditional preoccupation in the securities uh, law area, the preoccupation with conduct, you know, with investor protection per se, and going beyond that, looking at the structural factors, structural drivers uh, of the changes in the market that implicate a lot of those concerns with misconduct in financial markets and securities markets with the, the need to heighten perhaps the standards for protecting investors and so on and so forth. But those structural factors seem to kind of go unnoticed in much of the discussion. So in kind of looking for uh, uh, some prompts for these comments for today, I've reread the articles that uh, were uh, kind of suggested to us as panelists. And the 2016 article, The Challenge of Fiduciary Regulation, uh, I, I've just rereading it, I've realized uh, you know, what a wonderful piece that is, because there are some specific suggestions there that Roberta makes, or specific observations, that I think really kind of paved the road for future uh, scholarship and future inquiry into some of the most important big picture structural shifts not only in the investment management industry, but in the financial industry more generally. So what, what are those three things in, 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 in my view? Um, for example, at some point, Roberta is talking about conflict of interest you know, uh, within the uh, uh, investment advisors firms when the advisor is actually a part, an organizational part of a large financial holding company. And that, of course, goes directly to the kind of work that I do. Big financial holding companies with banking affiliates at the center of it with a variety of other uh, functional financial service providers. How does it change the kinds of uh, products that are being uh, you know, pushed, let's say, by, uh, by the investment advisors, right? How does it change the incentives of the investment advisor within that structure? And how does it change the way the SEC and the rest of us should think about investment management when the organizational structure within its, which it's embedded has changed so much since 1999 and continues to change? So that observation is a very small part of this article, right? But to me, it really kind of outlines a very important 
uh, avenue for future research. Another one that kind of struck me was when Roberta talks about the use of the corporate form by the investment advisors to avoid personal liability, like in the Madoff case, for example, right? And to me, that again opens up yet another can of worms that hopefully future scholars might actually look at. For example, does the use of corporate form by investment managers, by, uh, by advisors, right, uh, actually creates a deeper uh, and more embedded, more even more inherent uh, source of conflict of interest? Because now the advisor itself, being a corporation, has fiduciary duty to its own shareholders, right? Internal sort of fiduciary duty to produce, to generate revenues, to produce profits and so on and so forth. And how does that kind of compare to the fiduciary duty of the investment advisor to the beneficiary of its advice, right? The, the users uh, or the consumers of its product out there. And finally, the most inter the, another interesting um, kind of structural factor that in this article Roberta talks about in greater detail is the changed population of advisors and their clients. And she specifically talks about the retirement uh, savings and how um, in the you know, recent decades, sort of the shift to the defined contribution plans basically put all of us, or at least those amongst us who are lucky enough to have access to these plans uh, in this sort of bucket of effectively captive providers of capital that flow through these incredibly complex institutional structures into the hands of large institutional uh, sort of investment advisory firms, investment managers, right? The Fidelities, the, the Vanguards, the Black Rocks of the world and how huge they've become in recent decades. I looked up some uh, numbers about their assets under management. They're in trillions of dollars, right? And what's interesting in Carmela's, uh, in um, Roberta's discussion is that she actually talks about the bifurcation within the industry. The investment advisory industry is still huge and it's very diverse. In addition to these huge institutions that uh, sit on trillions of dollars and offer an increasingly diverse number of financial products, their power is more uh, about market power. It's about being a platform now for a variety of financial services that are not traditionally associated with the kind of an investment manager, investment advisor that perhaps in the 1930s, 40s or 60s, we had in mind or our predecessors had in mind. Very different business. And yet we have thousands and thousands of small investment advisors, uh, financial planners, uh, wealth management offices and so on and so forth, who continue to follow the more traditional um, sort of a form of business. So what does that mean for solutions? And this is where just very quickly to uh, pick up on what Arthur uh, brought up about the SROs, right? SROs that uh, Roberta advocates as a solution, uh, at least partial solution in the 2016 piece, what I like about that approach is that it is a fundamentally structural approach to the set of problems that she identifies. And I do wonder if um, the next step in the inquiry should be kind of given the bifurcation of the investment management industry based on scale and scope, diversity of products and kind of business models, should we kind of think about an SRO for investment advisors as a more suitable structural solution for the majority of smaller, more traditional investment advisors and think about a different set of perhaps structural solutions for large scale uh, advisory firms that we have in the market now. So those are the kinds of thoughts that I, as a banking law scholar kind of think about, and that's what inspires me in Roberta's scholarship. Uh, and I hope that future scholars of investment management and securities industry kind of join us on the banking side in thinking about those structural factors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll turn now to Arthur and Alan, who will have a total of about 10 to 15 minutes to respond or provide any further reactions. Sure, I'm happy to start unless, unless Alan, you want to begin, in which case, please feel free. Feel free. Okay, um, sure. So, um, uh, well, I also see a, I also see Roberta's hand. I don't know, Roberta, if you want to speak first, because I'm more than happy to defer. I don't need to speak now. Well, I've usually spoken 
after everybody has done their presentations. I don't have quite as much to say about all of these presentations, maybe because it's the end of two very long days. I don't know. I think we're all a little tired. Um, but I really enjoyed everyone's presentation. And I'm sitting here thinking each one of you is a person that I tried to get come to some kind of a relationship with Brooklyn Law School, with Solly and Arthur. I really failed to do that other than inviting you to conferences, which you've been coming to. With Alan, you have come as a visitor and we've enjoyed that. And with Buddy, you came and took over the investment management course I was teaching. And I'm just so happy that you were able to do that. So um, this has been a real pleasure for me to hear all of you comment on my work. And I think the only thing I might be able to add to what everybody was saying is, as you, Alan, mentioned, um, I am now on the board of directors of the Certified Financial Planner Standard Setting Organization, which fits in very well with this um, panel on investment advisors, because Financial planners are tested not only for their perception or their adherence to fiduciary standards, and there is the fiduciary duty that is attached to being a certified financial planner, but they're also tested as to their competence so that they can get the financial planner's certificate. So I think this maybe is a way that investment advisors, at least for retail investors, are going to have to go in the future. And I've been very privileged that I'm able to have a window on a part of the securities industry that I really didn't know very much about before I got onto this board. So please, Arthur, you go ahead with your comments. Sure. So just following up on, on what you said a minute ago, I, I think what's going on at, at the CFP board, by the way, is really fascinating. So for those of you who don't know this, and, and I'm sure many of you do, the CFP board was really way out in front of, of the SEC and was trying to determine whether or not to place a fiduciary duty on, on their own certificate holders and how to do that and what what context that would apply in, when it would, when it would not apply. And they went ahead and did it and they adopted rules because they just didn't know what, what would happen um, at the SEC. Um, I, I don't know what they would have done if they would have waited for, for Reg BI because as you all know, Reg BI does not impose a fiduciary duty per se, although some people say it comes very close, but Roberta, it just really makes me so happy that you're sitting on that on that board and that they're getting your input because um, I think they're they're, their hearts are in the right place. They're, they're trying to do the right thing, but like any organization, uh, they, they may or may not uh, uh, come out where, where, where some of us think, think they should. Um, so just a couple of quick uh, follow-up comments, because I, I think we have time. Um, so just in terms of the SRO for investment advisors, I'll take the bait on this. I don't know, um, uh, Buddy and Sally, you both mentioned this. And as I say, R Roberta has, um, has it in, in, in her piece. I mean, look, we all know that it's sort of easy to say that there should be an SRO for investment advisors and end the discussion there. They, they need more supervision. We've got data on, on how they are not um, inspected and examined at the frequency of, of broker dealers. And there are many more investment advisors, but obviously the devil is in the details and the, the problems there are many. Um, the first question is who's gonna be the SRO for investment advisors? So a lot of people say it should be FINRA as Roberta recognized in her piece, but, but even she was careful to say whether or not it's FINRA, right, we ought to do this. And there are lots of concerns about, about naming FINRA as the SRO for investment advisors when FINRA is in the business of regulating broker dealers and investment advisors try very much to separate themselves from the broker dealer community. Um, there are issues of cost. Smaller investment advisors don't necessarily uh, want to uh, 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 pay the freight to uh, to fund a, a an SRO for advisors. Um, there's all sorts of issues with dual registrants and and how they they work. Would they be regulated by both Finra and and the new SRO if there were one for investment advisors? And to be honest, broker dealers and investment advisors have very different regulatory regimes, and many people believe that it makes sense for 
an SRO to regulate broker dealers because of some of the highly technical uh, requirements that are placed on brokers. That's not really the same for advisors. Regulation is more fiduciary based and principles based. And so the question is, does it, does it really make sense to have that, that extra layer of supervision? So um, at some point, I, 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 you know, Buddy and Sally or, or Roberta may have additional, additional comments, but those were some quick thoughts I had about the SRO. In terms of Alan's um, comments. So just Alan, one or two things you might want to think about instead of a focus on the enduring fiduciary. I'm not really sure what that what that means. I mean, another take on this, we may want to take our cue from Roberta's article in the Notre Dame Law Review. And instead of thinking about the enduring fiduciary, think more about the fiduciary duty as the enduring principle in investment management regulation, something that Roberta and I spoke about some months ago, and I hope we have more conversations about that. So that's at least in another way, I think. I'm not, again, I'm not 100% sure what, what the enduring fiduciary means, but another angle is to, is to think about the principles as the enduring principles. And then I wasn't quite sure what you were saying about the, the, the SEC as a possible fiduciary. At least I think that's what you mentioned, although I wasn't quite sure that I, that I heard you cor correctly. That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting idea. I mean, there's a literature developing um, on public fiduciary law. And as I've seen that, that's, that's typically applied to the courts or to elected officials. I haven't seen a lot of literature applying public fiduciary law to administrative agencies. Uh, but, but I have to say, if, that, if that's one thing that you were suggesting or, or thinking about, I think that would be, that, that would be just fascinating. Um, and then finally, Solly, your, your st the second point that you made about the use of the corporate form to avoid liability by, by investment advisors, again, just such an interesting topic. I mean, uh, that, that, that exact issue, that, that's this enduring conflict that, that it, the investment management literature discusses between advisors and funds. And as, as we know, Section 36B of the Investment Company Act tries to address that, that conflict of interest. And and there's lots, been lots of cases in the excessive fee area. Those cases have now largely gone away. They, there are, as far as I know, no cases now in the federal courts. That's because the plaintiffs haven't been quite successful, but there have been attempts to, to deal with that conflict of interest, to regulate that conflict of interest. I think that's one thing 36B tries to do. Um, I, I guess the jury is out on whether that provision has been successful because as I say, there were lots of cases brought, a lot of settlements. Some people say fees have come, you know, way down as a result of those cases, but at least today it's dead, right? There are no more uh, uh, 36B cases addressing conflicts of interest between advisors and funds in, in the federal courts, as far as I know. Arthur, it's, uh, it's Buddy. And uh, on the SRO, I was not um, necessarily advocating uh, for the, an SRO for advisors. Uh, and, you know, as much as I think it's a, uh, a recognition by those of us who talk about that of a real challenge that exists, which um, has to do with uh, the resources that are necessary really to have the right regulatory structure around investment advisors. I'll just throw a point out. 70% of the investment advisors that are registered with the SEC represent 2.9% of the assets. Right. So 30 30 you know, percent of the um, of the advisors registered with the SEC have 97 percent of the assets. Right. So it is you know an incredible the 175 largest investment advisors have 64 percent of the assets. Right. So just you know aside that the the industry is just um, a challenge I think for uh, for for the issue of how to deal with it. And I'm hopeful that maybe at some point technology can help. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the ability really for the regulators to have uh, easier access in, in, to the information they need to be able to, to regulate effectively without necessarily having boots on the ground to, uh, to go and visit. So it's an, it, I think it's an extraordinarily important issue um, uh, uh, that doesn't have an easy solution to it. And just one quick follow-up. I remember uh, many years ago when I was still at the SEC, that OC was what was then OC was talking about virtual data rooms and getting essentially having 
um, having a, a, a presence in the investment advisory firms uh, through a virtual data room in a way that, as far as I know, they still haven't haven't managed to do. I'm sure Solly is more familiar than I am with the way banking regulators do their examinations, where um, the regulators are at the firm on a full time basis, as far as I understand, week after week or month after month, and that that's just not the case in the investment advisor area, as far as I know. So, so Arthur, this conversation causes me to think about the nuts and bolts question, what should be on an investment advisor exam for certification or for a registered rep? And we are of the mindset that, uh, you know, financial accounting, everything comes in some way or another, I think, to the question of financial accounting and what's part of financial accounting. But for me, we are, going through such a rapid transformation a way uh, that, that includes financial accounting, but that includes other accounting. And, you know, it took how many centuries before we got Pacioli right? We got financial accounting more or less right. And it took in the 33 Act to, to professionalize financial accounting. And we are charged within a decade to come up with sustainability accounting. Okay, so I think we have about, I don't know, uh, 18 minutes for uh, Q&A, and I want to make sure that there is an opportunity for, for the audience to join in. So um, if, if people are general attendees, uh, please use the Q&A section, but uh, people who are panelists on former panels, uh, I think you're able to raise your hand or at least uh, turn off your camera, uh, and you can also participate as well. Uh, and I think Jill Fish has the first question. So then I have to do all the stuff to make myself visible and audible again after hours. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right question for this panel or the prior panel, but I've been sitting here and wondering about all of the issues that we've been hearing about with respect to the new um, web-based brokers and particularly payment for order flow and sort of different uh, ways of sort of structuring both uh, execution responsibilities and um, uh, business models. And I guess I'm wondering um, whether uh, you think this is a, a, uh, an exchange issue, a FINRA issue, an individual brokerage issue. Um, you know, I, I'm having trouble getting a handle on just kind of what the right body is to think about these questions, putting aside the sort of hard, harder question that I'm not going to ask about what's the right answer to these questions. So, so it was it was the previous panel. That's what I would say, having been on the previous panel. Well, you know, it, if, if, yeah. Jim, if you want to, if you want to respond, oh, no, no. I mean, I think it's, a, it's like a best execution question. I think even that's how the SEC is looking at it today, with Robinhood. I mean, it was isn't payment for order flow. It was always, are you getting the best execution? I think their recent. It's not really an action, but when they were talking about the disclosure with respect to Robin Hood, they said, did you really disclose, you know, did you disclose adequately your best execution practices? And then did you disclose adequately that maybe you didn't really get the best execution when you were sending everything to Citadel? And so, I mean, I think that's the classic way of looking at it. I don't know if the advisor group here would say, okay, there's, there's another way of, I mean, that's a fiduciary duty of a broker dealer, one of their duties. Well, if the, I mean, if the question is what institution is the right institution, I mean, it seems to me that these are FINRA issues. Jill, yeah. that's the first way I would, I would answer the question, but as we all know, in the broker dealer area, the SEC gets to pick and choose, right? Because it has jurisdiction over the regulation of broker dealers. And so I would say, yes, in the first instance, that's exactly why we want an SRO. That's why we have an SRO. They've got the expertise and it's absolutely an SRO issue. But if the new chairman thinks this is a hot issue for him, and he wants to he wants to get involved. Then absolutely, the SEC gets to pick and choose where they jump in institutionally on broker dealer issues. But it's a must for Finra, right? They can't they can't ignore it. It's absolutely in their ambit. I think if the question is about institutions, that that's that's I think how I would 
answer that? I, I guess part of the reason that I um, held back on the question is I guess I, I agree that it's in FINRA's jurisdiction, but it seems to me it's also a market structure issue. And it is also, as Jim said, a fiduciary issue. And that's where I'm kind of confused about, well, you know, if, if FINRA handles it, um, is FINRA really the right institution to take into account the market structure uh, considerations? Um, if the, you know, for, for, for the advisors, you know, we've gone back and forth on this debate between investment advisors and brokers and who's got what kind of duties. Um, but also you think about different pay structures and that's where a lot of that debate has come in. Payment for order flow is a way of compensating somebody who's going to be an advisor in some capacity or other. Yeah, absolutely. And if we're talking about if, if we're talking about investment advisors, then here's Roberta's argument for an SRO for, for investment advisors. So, so this is I, I don't know. If, I don't want to speak for Roberta, but but I, I can make the case and say Jill is making the argument for precisely the reason why we need an SRO for investment advisors. Now, uh, as I say, there's there's that's a fraud issue. There's a lot of a lot of tough issues to, to hash out, but I think the claim is. We should get past those. Those are administrative. Lots of smart people can put their heads together and get, get figure out what to do with dual registrants and who the SRO is going to be. But as a structural matter, we need an SRO for exactly the reasons that 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 Jill expresses. Right now, it's on the plate of of the Division of Investment Management, and Buddy can speak to this. I mean, how do you make decisions on what issues you deal with and when when you have just an overwhelming number of issues? Pouring into, pouring into the division that all need to be addressed. And, and Jill's mentioning one, but that one may have to take a back burner because you've got other issues that are even more pressing. Um, I, I would say in terms of payment for order flow, this goes all the way back to rebates on fixed commissions. And the securities industry has always been hooked on these kind of rebate of practices of one kind or another. And the SEC has never had the backbone to really do much about it. And I don't know if they would do it now or not. I mean, maybe there has to be a bigger crisis than something like Robin Hood for the SEC to act. But I'm not sure FINRA can really solve this problem. It's too embedded in the securities industry and has been for so many years. You know, Roberta, this is tough because now trading is free, right? And trading is free in part because of payment for order flow. So I, I, <laughs> it, it's a tough spot to be in to say, well, we're going to rein in practices like payment for order flow when America likes free trading, right? That, that, that's a good development for many investors. And far be it for me to say that, that that's not helpful and, and good for lots of folks in America who want to trade. And so it, it's, it's very tricky. It's, it's like payment for research. I mean, when payment for research was... Um, looked askance at by the SEC and more or less eliminated, a, a lot of research disappeared. So yes, I agree. These are very complex issues. And I'm glad I'm not an SEC commissioner and I don't have to deal with it today. <laughs> so um, I have a- You know, missing, I, I'm sorry, I may have cut somebody off. Uh, it, it seems missing from this is the further question of how much we want to encourage, Arthur, as you're saying, the, the, the free trading. And uh, that's, that's something that uh, has come to the retail markets. And we've seen that uh, this may be a little bit, uh, you know, too volatile for many, re uh, a volatile tool for many retail investors uh, that you can trade in Bitcoin, you can trade in uh, you, you know, manipulated stock. It, it uh, um, for me, raises questions of the SEC taking a more protective role.
So I had a question for Alan um, and also invite uh, more questions from, from the audience. Uh, um, following up on uh, Arthur's response, I do think there's a literature that describes uh, federal agencies as fiduciaries. Um, Evan Criddle uh, really did the pathbreaking work here. Uh, and then Paul Miller and I have, have followed up in a slightly different direction. Um, but the question I have is, what would it mean? So you raised the, the concern of uh, who fiduciaries owe their obligations to. And I think an agency like the SEC raises this question in a very complex way. Um, so you might think that they're fiduciaries toward the, say, the retail investor or uh, the most vulnerable party that is involved in the securities world. You might think that they're fiduciaries toward the parties that they regulate um, on the theory that uh, public fiduciaries frequently are supposed to be fiduciaries in light of the power they exercise over whoever they're controlling or whatever assets they're controlling. Um, you might think that an agency is um, a fiduciary toward the general public as a whole. Um, you might think that fiduciaries sometimes are meant to act loyally in a, to advance an abstract purpose. So loyalty to the cause of justice, for example. And so maybe there's something like that that the SEC has as part of its fiduciary obligation. Um, or you might think that agencies are to some degree like agents of Congress, um, in which case there's a certain kind of fiduciary relationship uh, toward Congress as well. Um, and then lastly, you might think it's some mixture that has to be balanced in a complicated way. Uh, so I was wondering if you have a thought on if the SEC is a fiduciary, who it owes fiduciary duties to. So we've actually been talking about that for the last couple of days. And the statutory language suggests the answer is yes. And the history of the SEC's relationship with Congress is yes uh, to all of them. Um, the uh, purpose of every regulation is to protect investors, assure market efficiency, and protect the public or to serve the public, some public interest, to serve the public interest. And so embedded in that is the invitation to um, uh, multiple, sometimes uh, overlapping, sometimes conflicting roles and how the agency mediates that, I think uh, requires having a kind of wisdom uh, having a deep understanding of history the way that Roberta does and informs us often about, and to further know that, um, um, that there won't be one answer for every situation and that the answers will change over time. I, I, I think it's actually, um, for example, it's interesting. Um, the SEC hasn't changed the accredited investor dollar caps. And that would seem to be a failure to continue to protect people, but it's also a, a, a democratization of investment. It means that a mere millionaire can now uh, invest the way that a, in 1982 dollars, a multi, multi-millionaire um, uh, would today. And uh, these are all fluid questions. I think that's one of the, the great things about rereading Roberta's articles is that uh, they identify that uh, uh, past is prelude and prelude is past. So Andrew, if I can just jump in for a second on your question. So I, I don't know if, if this was intentional, but I think in some ways to ask the question is to answer it um, because the way you set forth the possible duties owed to retail investors, regulated entities, the general public and an abstract purpose Again, I'm not sure, Alan, how, how you square those. I mean, that, that, that's quite difficult. The analogy very often is, well, corporations have to do that, right? Because their boards of directors owe fiduciary duties to both shareholders and debt holders whose interests diverge. And so look, you can owe fiduciary duties to diverging interests. That's what we do with corporations. But I think that that's not really an apt analogy. Um, and again, others who are in this um, in this conference, certainly know more about this than I do uh, and can speak to it more eloquently. But I, I imagine that there, the, real, the, the issue is really the level of risk that the board wants to tolerate 
Um, but that's very different than saying that a regulator has a fiduciary duty to retail investors on the one hand and to the broker dealer firm on the other, whose interests are very often just diametrically, diametrically opposed to each other. So I, I, I'm a, just speaking personally, I'm a little bit skeptical of some of the public fiduciary literature that would, I think, try to apply that to um, an agency like, like the SEC. I, I'd like to see it, but it just seems to me that Initially, there are some there are some questions there are some questions there. I, I think I agree. We won't get any answers. I, I can't believe that the literature would give us answers. Would give us a hierarchy, or would give us a model that, that provides a way of proceeding in a particular question. Uh, to f- formulate the question is valuable, and to see how it's come out in different instances. Uh, for example, you know, the, the, the order flow question is to recognize that the industry needs a little bit of, uh, 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 of compensation, uh, but uh, maybe not too much. And it's, these, I think, uh, provide us a, a reminder that uh, we are not going to have either or answers to, to or questions to most of these uh, topics. So we, we just have a few moments left. Uh, did anybody on the panel maybe have some further thoughts? Okay. Um, well, I, in that case, uh, I guess what I'd, what I'd like to do is just, uh, first of all, thank our panelists, I think for a wonderful panel, um, but also thank uh, Roberta again for all of her contributions. I think, uh, You could certainly see on this panel uh, just how many of the ideas that have shown up over the past couple of days resurface in different forms, um, how engaged everybody is, uh, and uh, just what a remarkable influence uh, Roberta's had. Um, And uh, with that, I want to thank her. And we can uh, get ready to segue to the, the uh, the next section, uh, turn things over to our organizers, and we'll have some concluding remarks. So thank you. Okay, well, if you want to move it to me, uh, I just want to say a few concluding remarks. And uh, as you know, so much has been said uh, in the last two days about Roberta and her participation and and scholarship and then so many other things. And so I, I'm sure you feel the way I do that, well, we we could just keep going on. I mean, there's, we, we, we couldn't exhaust all the comments about her scholarship and her participation in our lives. And, but we have to, as as Roberta herself said, we have to bring things to an end. Uh, I would just remind you that, uh, I mean, her scholarship remains a part of, you know, the scholarship we do. And so it's, it's always part of it. And I think all of us, you know, we use this occasion to go back to it, uh, uh, you know, for this event, but I, I'm sure we can go back to it for our future work and whenever I, whenever we want. And I also would just remind you this, continue your conversations with Roberta. I think she would, she, you know, and she, I'll open, let her conclude with a few remarks, but it's been, this has been so exciting for her. I'm sure it's probably even given her ideas for other things. And so I hope, I hope we don't just end, you know, or you personally don't end with, with your, you know, your conversations with her and with all of us today, because uh, I know when I was planning this with Miriam and Ted, you know, she, she said, well, this is, this is so exciting. This is what I would really like to have you know, commemorate me in this occasion. And so I think you should use it as a opportunity to keep the conversation going. And with that, I just like to say, Roberta, do you want to say any concluding remarks yourself, or at least just uh, one more time? One more time to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who has had anything to do with this conference, to the organizers, Jim Fanto, Miriam Baer, Ted Janger, to all of the participants, all of the commentators. This has been such an exciting two days of my life. 
I'm really very grateful. And um, I've been sitting here thinking, everyone's talking about all my scholarship. Did I really write all of that? Did I really say all of these things? Do I still believe all of them now? I don't know. Maybe I should go back and read some of the things I wrote myself, the way in which all of you have done. So teaching and writing has been such an important part of my career. I've enjoyed all parts of my career, uh, government service, private practice, boards, but being an academic has, I think, given me the greatest feeling of satisfaction. Um, and doing all of the scholarship is something that I have so enjoyed. I always imagined I would be a writer. I don't know that I imagined I would be a writer in the business law area, but I started writing when I was in grade school and I've been writing ever since. And I am very pleased and honored that there is going to be this fest shrift in my honor and I will treasure it, treasure it very much. So all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody. Um, this has been a wonderful two days for me. Well, thank you, Roberta. And again, thanks to all the panelists. And, and I just say let the conversations continue with, with all of us and with you, Roberta. And so goodbye for now. Thank you all.